Hi, this is Jeffrey Reddick, creator of Final Destination. Greetings, Slashaholics. This is David Bergantino, author of the Freddy Krueger's Tales of Terror books, the Bard's Blood Horror Shakespeare books. Hey guys, this is Jason Brooks, Jason Voorhees from Friday the 13th Vengeance. Hey, this is Slasher Pepper. Hey everybody, it's CJ Graham, Jason, Friday the 13th Part 6. This is William Patterson, known to Friday the 13th fans as Eric Morris. Hi, this is Deborah Voorhees from Friday the 13th Part 5. Hey folks. This is Adam Marcus, director of Jason Goes to Hell and Secret Santa. <laughs> Hello, kitties. This is John Kassir, the voice of the Crypt Keeper. Hi, this is Kane Hodder, better known as Jason from Friday the 13th, Victor Crowley from Hatchet. And you're listening. You're listening. And you're listening. And you're listening. I just want to make sure you guys know you're listening. You are listening. And you are listening. And you are lucky enough to be listening. Okay, boils and ghouls, you are listening. You are listening to the 80s Slasher Librarian. To the 80s Slasher Librarian. To the 80s Slasher Librarian. The 80s Slasher Librarian. To the 80s Slasher Librarian. To 80s Slasher Librarian. To 80s Slasher Librarian. To the 80s Slasher Librarian. To the 80s slasher librarian. To the 80s slasher librarian. Keep listening, or I'll kill you. Hey, slashaholics, be sure to subscribe to the channel, click that bell for notifications on all upcoming uploads, and be sure to smash that like button. And tonight's upload is brought to you by our patrons over on the Patreon page. That's Bonanza Jellybean, Bree, Carl Eakin, Cecilia Spears, Allison Seib, Hawaii, Iron Alexa, Catherine McClear, Kai Antez, Ryan Woodward, Sean Campbell, and TikTok12. Thank you all so much for supporting the channel through Patreon. You guys are the reason the channel keeps going. And if anybody listening right now enjoys the content here on the 80 Slasher Librarian YouTube channel and would like to help the channel continue to go and grow for years to come, please take the time to head over to the Patreon page where you can sign up for as low as 2 to $5 per month. You help the channel keep growing, because we're not able to monetize it here on YouTube because the uh, copyright holders get all the ad revenue. So I depend on you listeners to take the time to sign up on Patreon. And I do offer some great rewards for you, depending on the tier you select. Some of those rewards include early access content before it reaches YouTube, free slasher ebooks sent to you via email, free merch from the merch store, guest spots and upcoming narrations where you can voice a character in audiobooks monthly, and guest spots on the podcast, and much more. So just head over to Patreon, check it out, find the tier that's right for you to get the rewards you want and to support the channel. If you appreciate what I'm doing here on the channel, then I would greatly appreciate your support on Patreon. Red right hand You'll see him in your nightmares You'll see him in your dreams He'll appear out of nowhere But he's not what he seems You'll see him in your head And on the TV screen Hey buddy, I'm warning you to turn it off He's a ghost, he's a god He's a man, he's a guru A Nightmare on Elm Street, the novelization of the first film. A novel by Jeffrey Cooper. Prologue. Freddy was dead. The good people of Elm Street had seen to it that the Springwood Slasher would never bother anyone ever again. Ten years had come and gone since then, and only now were the good people of Elm Street beginning to sleep peacefully at night, safe and warm in their cozy suburban bedrooms. Freddy was dead and gone. But the nightmare was just about to begin.
Chapter 1 Tina woke up screaming, the covers clutched tightly in her trembling hands. "'Are you all right?' asked her mother from the doorway. "'Sure, Ma,' whispered Tina. "'It was just a bad dream.' "'Just a bad dream,' she repeated to herself, trying very hard to believe her own words. Tina had not lived fifteen years without suffering an occasional bad dream. But this dream was not like anything she had ever known before. There was something evil about this dream. It had started innocently enough. Tina was lost in a vast room full of thick, leaky pipes and pounding machinery. It was a boiler room, similar to the one at school, only it was unbelievably large, and Tina was wearing the same thin nightgown she had gone to sleep in. Despite the steam that pervaded the stifling air, she had felt chilled to the bone as she wandered aimlessly through iron doorways and along ramps and down metal ladders that seemed always to lead nowhere. And she remembered animal noises. A lamb had bleated, and Tina's heart had begun to pound furiously in her chest. What a lamb was doing in the boiler room in the first place, and why its bleeding should be so terrifying, were questions Tina couldn't have answered, even if her life had depended on it. And why did she feel that it might? Then there was the fabric, a dirty piece of cloth hanging in the middle of nowhere. And suddenly it tore open with a terrible ripping noise, as four gleaming blades like steel fingers glittered threateningly into the murky darkness. Tina began to run, but she was thoroughly lost and didn't know which way to go. There was a horrible screeching sound as the steel blades scraped against the iron pipes like fingernails on a chalkboard, or the high-pitched whine of a dentist's drill as it digs painfully into an exposed nerve. And Tina kept running, knowing that her life depended on escape, but knowing, too, that ultimately there could be no escape. And then she stopped to catch her breath and wipe away the sweat that streamed down her face in hot rivulets. And for one sweet moment, Tina felt safe. Perhaps, she thought, just perhaps, there might be a way out after all. And that was when the man with the razor blade fingers loomed up behind her, clawing at her nightgown with insane fury as he enfolded her in his deadly arms. It was Tina's scream that had awoken her and summoned her mother to the bedroom. "'You sure you're all right?' her mother asked again, still leaning up against the door jam. "'It was just a dream,' repeated Tina. "'It must have been some dream.' Mrs. Gray shook her head slowly from side to side as she gazed at her daughter's nightgown. Tina looked down, suddenly aware of the four long slashes up the middle of her favorite nightgown. "'You better cut your fingernails or stop that kind of dreaming,' said her mother. "'One or the other.' She looked at her daughter one more time and then quietly shut the door behind her. Instinctively, Tina reached back and removed the crucifix that hung on her bedroom wall. She clutched it to her heart as the old jump rope song that she had sung as a child seemed to chant itself in her brain. That's what it reminded me of, Tina told her best friend Nancy Thompson the next morning. That old jump rope song? Worst nightmare I ever had. The girls had just stepped out of Glenn Lance's old red convertible. Glenn had already taken Nancy's books as the three young people strode briskly toward the old high school building. As a matter of fact, said Nancy, I had a bad dream last night myself. Tina was about to ask Nancy about her dream when Rod Lane trotted up from behind and draped his right arm over her shoulders. "'I had a hard-on this morning when I woke up, Tina,' he said. "'Had your name written all over it.' Tina looked at the boy and shrugged off his arm. "'There's four letters in my name, Rod,' she said. "'How could there be room on your joint for four letters?' Nancy and Glenn laughed out loud. Despite Tina's flip attitude toward the boy, Nancy knew that her friend really liked him. There always seemed to be an almost tangible sexual tension in the air whenever Tina and Rod were together, and the fact that Tina's mother couldn't stand the boy only added to his appeal. Rod had never looked like the rest of them, in his heavy boots and his black leather jacket, and he had a vulgar way of expressing himself that Nancy sometimes found a little embarrassing. 
Still, she knew that he was basically a good person, and she was confident that someday Tina Gray would be known as the girl who finally tamed the infamous Rod Lane. Rod, on the other hand, would never be known for the brilliance of his chivalry. Hey, he yelled as Tina, Nancy, and Glenn strode off without him. Up yours with the twirling lawn mower. Rod says the sweetest things, said Tina as the boy took off across the lawn. He's nuts about you, said Nancy, smiling at her friend. Yeah, nuts. Anyway, I'm too tired to worry about it. I couldn't get back to sleep at all last night. Tina paused and looked at Nancy. So what did you dream? Forget it, said Nancy. She felt herself shudder as she recalled the nightmare that had kept her up most of the night. The point is, everybody has nightmares once in a while. It's no biggie. Uh, the next time you have one, suggested Glenn, just tell yourself that that's all it is, right while you're having it. Once you do that, you wake up right away. He looked at Nancy and shrugged. At least it works for me. They had just reached the steps in front of Springwood High when the first bell began to ring. Glenn quickly kissed Nancy on the cheek and dashed off to his first class. Hey! yelled Tina as the boy took off, climbing two steps at a time. Did you have a nightmare too? But Glenn was gone. Tina turned back to Nancy and sighed deeply. Maybe we're going to have an earthquake or something. They say things get really weird before an earthquake. But there was no earthquake and Tina was still thinking about her dream when she got home from school that afternoon. It didn't make her feel any better to learn that her mother was going to be spending the next couple of nights out of town with her current boyfriend. The first thing Tina did was invite Nancy to spend the night at her house. Neither girl objected when Glenn decided to tag along. I'm glad you could stay over, said Tina when her friends arrived. When my mom said she was taking off for two days, I almost died. No problem, said Nancy, giving her friend's arm a reassuring squeeze. Nancy and Glenn to the rescue. The girls settled themselves on the couch, and Glenn announced that he had to call home. I can't believe his mother is letting him stay over here, said Tina. Well, said Nancy with a mischievous smile, she isn't exactly. The girls watched as Glenn inserted a cassette into the oversized tape player he had placed on the table next to the telephone. I've got this cousin who lives near the airport, he explained while he waited for his mother to pick up the phone. So I've borrowed this sound effects tape. Hello, Mom? He pushed a button on the tape player, and the sound of a 747 coming in for a landing suddenly filled the room. Yeah, I'm, I'm out at Barry's, he said. He grinned at the girls, and Nancy put a hand over Tina's mouth to stop her from laughing. Yeah, noisy as usual. Glad we don't live here. What? Oh, Aunt Eunice says hello. The roar of the jet was overwhelming now, as if Glenn were standing in the middle of the runway. I'll call you in the morning, he shouted, his lips pressed up against the mouthpiece. Don't worry, I... Suddenly, the tape was silent. Then a new roaring began, but this time it was the roar of stock cars screeching at top speed around a racetrack. I'm not sure, said Glenn into the telephone, struggling to improvise. I think some kids are drag racing outside. Then the sound effects changed again. There was a screech of brakes, a blood-curdling scream, and the sound of a horrible collision. Nancy jumped up from the couch and tried to turn off the tape recorder, but her fingers found the fast-forward instead. I gotta go, Mom, said Glenn, glaring at Tina, as she dissolved into laughter on the couch. I think there's been an accident out front. Meanwhile, Nancy had managed to turn the machine back on, but now they were in the middle of a full-scale war, complete with chattering machine guns and exploding bombs. Right, shouted Glenn. I'll call the police. No, no, just some neighbors having a fight, I guess. I'm fine, Mom. No, uh, no, I'll call... I'll call, I'll call you in the morning. At last, Nancy found the stop button, and the room was filled with blessed silence. Worked like a charm, said Nancy, as she and Tina exploded with laughter. An hour later, Tina, Nancy, and Glenn were relaxing in front of a cozy fire and listening to soft music on the stereo. Maybe we should call Rod and ask him over, 
said Nancy as she snuggled up next to Glenn on the couch. Rod and I are through, said Tina. She sat back and propped her feet up on the coffee table. He's too much of a maniac. He should join the Marines, said Glenn. Maybe they could make something out of him, like a hand grenade. Tina laughed. See, said Nancy, you're forgetting the bad dream already, didn't I tell you? Tina shook her head sadly, the smile gone from her face. All day long I've been seeing that guy's weird face, she said, and I keep hearing those fingernails. Fingernails? echoed Nancy, staring at her friend in amazement. It's so strange that you're saying that. It made me remember the dream I had last night. What did you dream, Nancy? I dreamed about this guy in a dirty red and green sweater. Nancy suddenly felt very uncomfortable. And he had these fingernails that he scraped along things. Actually, they were more like knives or something, like he'd made them himself. Anyway, they made this horrible screeching noise. Nancy imitated the chilling sound of metal scraping against metal, and Tina sat up straight in her chair. "'You dreamed about the same creep I did?' she said. "'That's impossible,' said Glenn as the two girls stared at each other. Two people can't—' He stopped abruptly and looked out the window. "'What is it?' whispered Tina. "'Nothing,' said Glenn. "'There's somebody out there.' "'I didn't hear anything,' said Nancy.' And then they all heard it, the thin, sharp sound of something scraping against the house, just outside the window. Jesus, whispered Tina. It was Glenn who made the first move. He unlocked the door and stepped out into the darkness. I'm going to punch out your ugly lights, whoever you are, he announced. But the only answer was a slight rustling in the bushes. Glenn promptly turned around and headed back toward the house. But the two girls prodded him further into the darkness. It's only a stupid cat, he said a little more loudly than necessary as he edged slowly toward the bushes. He stopped in his tracks as the unmistakable scraping sound again disturbed the silence of the night. Kitty, kitty, said Glenn, taking a few cautious steps forward. Chow, chow, chow? There was no answer, but complete and utter silence. Glenn turned toward the girls with a shrug. He was about to speak when a large figure leaped out from behind a bush and threw him to the ground with a terrible shout. Tina turned to run for help when she recognized the hulking figure of Rod Lane. And it's number 36, the boy said, rising quickly to his feet, bringing Lance down just three yards from the goal with a brilliant tackle, and the fans go wild. Rod grinned wildly as he threw his arm around Tina's shoulders. What the hell are you doing here? asked Tina. I come to make up, said Rod. He glanced toward the house. Your ma home? Of course, the girl lied. She noticed the metal object in Rod's right hand. What's that? Rod held up a rusty old hand rake. He had found lying in the yard and scraped it slowly against the side of the house. Tina winced as she heard the horrible screeching noise that had first attracted Glenn's attention. Intense, huh? said Rod, tossing the rake aside. So what's happening? An orgy or something? Maybe a funeral, you jerk, said Glenn. He glared furiously at the boy who had just scared and humiliated him in front of the girls. Rod turned to Glenn sharply, and a switchblade knife suddenly appeared in his hand. Without a moment's hesitation, Nancy stepped between the two boys. It's a sleepover date, she told Rod. Just Tina and me. Glenn was just leaving. Rod stared at Glenn for a few long seconds before closing the knife and slipping it back into his jacket pocket. Glenn breathed a sigh of relief as Rod threw his arm around Tina again and laughed. You see his face? He said, grinning as if he had just pulled off a brilliant practical joke. Then he glanced at the house again and sized up the situation. Your ma ain't home, is she? Without waiting for an answer, he took Tina by the arm and began dragging her toward the house. Me and Tina got stuff to discuss, he said. We got her mother's bed. You two got the rest. Nancy waited uncertainly for a few seconds and then turned to Glenn. We should get out of here, she said. Before Glenn could reply, Tina reappeared at the front door. The top buttons of her blouse were already undone. You guys are hanging around, right? She said. Don't leave me alone with this lunatic. 
Nancy watched as her friend disappeared back into the house. She knew Tina really wanted to spend the night with Rod, and yet... So we'll guard her together, said Glenn, interrupting her thoughts. Through the night, Nancy looked at Glenn and nodded. We're here for Tina, not for ourselves, she said. Okay? In other words, Glenn thought as he nodded in agreement, I'm sleeping on the couch. Sometimes he wished that Nancy could be a little more like her friend Tina. Why was she so bothered by a stupid nightmare anyway? He asked as they began walking back towards the house. Because it was scary, that's all. Don't you think it's weird both of us dreaming about the same guy? Glenn looked away, and Nancy felt a sudden chill. You had a dream last night too, didn't you, Glenn? Glenn shrugged his shoulders. I never remember my dreams, he said. All I know is my mom's going to kill me when she does the wash. I, I practically ripped my sheet in half. Nancy wanted to continue the conversation, but it was getting late, and she was suddenly feeling very tired. She went inside with Glenn and kissed him good night. Then she locked herself in Tina's bedroom, leaving Glenn to make himself as comfortable as possible on the living room sofa. Glenn was feeling tired too, and he might have fallen asleep immediately if it weren't for the sounds of passionate love making that emanated from Tina's mother's bedroom. Glenn couldn't help thinking about Rod and Tina furiously copulating upstairs while he and Nancy spent the night in separate rooms. Morality sucks, he said softly. Then he pulled the covers up over his head and tried to get some sleep. Tina had a reputation for being fast. It wasn't something she was especially proud of, but it wasn't anything she lost sleep over either. Tina knew she didn't really deserve her reputation. Sure, she had slept with a few boys, but that didn't mean she was some kind of pushover. She liked sex, and she knew how to protect herself. If she wanted to fool around once in a while, Tina figured it was nobody's damn business but her own. I knew there was something about you I liked, she said, as she snuggled closer to Rod in her mother's bed that night. You feel better now, right? he asked with a satisfied grin. Jungle Man Fix Jane, said Tina. Rod was definitely a little rough around the edges, but there was a vulnerable side to the boy that really turned Tina on. No more fights? said Rod, his hand resting on Tina's small breast. No more fights, she agreed, feeling very sleepy and content. She thought about Nancy sleeping alone across the hall. It was hard for Tina to understand how her best friend could go out with a nice boy like Glenn for so long without wanting to go all the way. Good night, said Rod, yawning loudly as he pulled the cover over his head. No more nightmares for either of us, then. Suddenly, Tina felt a cold chill race down her spine. When did you have a nightmare? she asked. Guys have nightmares, too, said Rod. You girls don't exactly corner the market on dreams and nightmares. Tina stared at the unmoving figure beside her for a moment and then took a deep breath. She was glad to be here with Rod, and she wasn't going to let some dumb nightmare ruin things for her. Besides, she felt safe with Rod at her side. She watched him for a moment as he slept and then turned out the light. Tonight, I'm finally going to get a good night's sleep, she thought, even if it kills me. She had not been asleep long when she heard the noise. At first, she thought it was just the faucet dripping. She tried not to pay attention, but the pinging noises were too loud and too persistent to be ignored. Rod, she whispered, but the boy only snored steadily beside her. She sat up in bed, wondering how Rod could sleep through all the racket. There was another ping, and Tina realized it was coming from outside. She stepped into her slippers and reached the window in time to see a pebble bounce off the glass. Jesus, she whispered. It was windy out, and the trees were blowing wildly in the darkness. Suddenly, a large stone smashed into the glass, startling Tina as a thin and ragged crack appeared inside the window pane. Somebody threw that, thought Tina, suddenly furious at whoever was out there, disturbing her precious sleep. Without thinking, she dashed down the stairs and stepped out into the darkness. Who are you? she demanded. 
For a moment, she considered going back inside to get her robe, but something seemed to be compelling her to step farther into the blackness instead. Then she was at the gate, stepping outside before turning around to look at the house. Only she couldn't see the familiar old house on Elm Street anymore. Instead, she seemed to be in an alley that she vaguely remembered seeing before in a dream. It was completely quiet now, except for the rushing of the wind. Then the metal lid of a trash can came clattering down the alley, crashing to a halt at Tina's feet. She stared at the lid for a moment and took a deep breath to calm herself. She was still assuring herself that everything was all right when she heard the horrible scraping of metal on cinder block. And there in the darkness, she saw the man from her nightmare, his steel finger knives raising bright yellow sparks as they screeched horribly along the alley wall. Tina turned, looking for a place. She was about to make a break for the end of the alley when the horrible man suddenly extended his long, bony arms along the full length of the narrow alleyway, cutting off the girl's only escape route. Oh, God, she whispered. This is God replied the man hoarsely, his twisted mouth grinning obscenely as he clicked his razor-sharp blades in Tina's face. Chapter 2 and then, Tina was running. She didn't know how she slipped past the man in the red and green sweater, and there was no time to stop and think it over. Tina was running for her life, faster than she had ever run before. But as fast as she ran, the man with the deadly finger knives was never more than a few steps behind her. Tina was gasping for breath now, knocking over trash cans to slow down her pursuer. But nothing she did seemed to make any difference. Whenever she glanced over her shoulder, there he was, his hideous face leering at her from beneath his crumpled fedora and his deadly blades glittering in the moonlight. Then abruptly, Tina was no longer on the city streets, running instead across what seemed like an endless stretch of identical suburban lawns. Tina shouted for help, sure that someone would hear her and save her from the maniac who seemed determined to kill her. But there was no answer to her desperate cries, and the only sounds Tina could hear were those of her own labored breathing and the pounding of her bursting heart. And then she stopped for a second to catch her breath and looked behind her. There was no one there. Thank God, she thought, her lungs aching after her long, hard run. She looked around to get her bearings and suddenly realized that she was on her own block again. Boring old Elm Street had never looked lovelier. Tina took a deep breath and gazed fondly at the big elm tree that had stood at the corner for as far back as anyone could remember. And there stood the man in the filthy sweater, a look of mad triumph on his face. Tina didn't know how he had managed to hide behind the very tree she had been looking at, but there he was, large as life and a thousand times more frightening. Tina turned and ran, suddenly uncertain which of the almost identical houses on the block was hers. Then she saw it, the low brick wall her father had built in front of the house not long before her folks had split up. She ran toward the house, the madman's foul breath hot on her neck. It seemed to take forever, but finally she reached the door and grabbed desperately for the knob, locked. Nancy! She screamed, suddenly remembering that her friend was in the house. Nancy, open the door! Nancy can't help you, said the madman, now standing behind her with a fiendish grin on his deformed face. Nancy is still awake. Still awake, thought Tina, as she felt the razor-sharp blades slice through her thin nightgown and into her tender skin. And suddenly she was inside, lying safely next to Rod in her mother's bed. It was all just a dream, she told herself, smiling peacefully, as her head sank back into the soft pillow. Everything's going to be all right, after all. Then she saw him, and she knew that nothing was going to be all right ever again. Rod felt the bed shaking and opened his eyes. Tina? 
he said, slowly remembering where he was and whom he was with. But there was no answer except for the anguished cries and moans that seemed to be coming from somewhere deep inside the mattress. His heart pounding, Rod yanked the cover off the bed. He stared in horror at the sight of Tina, thrashing about wildly in her sleep. Then suddenly her body stiffened, as if someone or something was pinning her to the bed, and her nightgown was roughly pulled open by unseen hands. Rod watched helplessly as four long bloody gashes appeared across the girl's stomach, followed by four more and then four more, until Tina and the entire bed were soaked in a river of blood. Rod screamed and reached for the light. Suddenly, Tina's body rose from the bed as if lifted by invisible hands and swung through the air like a human baseball bat, knocking Rod to the floor. He lay there and watched in mute horror as Tina's mangled corpse slid feet first up the bedroom wall, leaving behind a trail of gore. What the hell is going on? Rod screamed, fighting back the tears and vomit as he watched the bloody pulp that was once Tina Gray hanging limp and lifeless from the ceiling suspended by some invisible and insanely sadistic power. His screams began in earnest as the girl's slashed remains plopped down like a sack of blood, splashing Rod and everything in the room as it hit the bed with a sickening thud. Nancy sat up in bed just as the body fell from the ceiling. She arrived at the bedroom door just moments before Glenn. "'What's going on?' asked Glenn. "'I don't know.' said Nancy, pulling on the door and finding it locked. From the other side, she could hear Rod's desperate threats. Who did this? He screamed, glaring around helplessly in search of whoever or whatever had murdered Tina. I swear I'll kill you for this. Rod, said Nancy, pounding on the door. You'd better not hurt Tina. And then Rod began to make the horrible rasping noise that Nancy would never forget for as long as she lived. She was still trying to decide whether he was laughing or crying when Glenn barreled into the door like the star football player that he was. The door burst open and Nancy rushed in and saw the blood, Tina's blood. The same blood that soaked the bed, the walls, the ceiling, and the curtains around the window through which Rod had made his escape. And then Nancy saw the hacked remains of her friend's body. She wanted to cry, but she didn't. Tears wouldn't bring Tina back to life, and they wouldn't catch the sadistic son of a bitch that had killed her. Someone would pay for this. Nancy swore it, even as the vomit began to surge upward from her throbbing guts. Chapter 3 Don Thompson had never wanted to be anything but a cop. Long after his boyhood pals had outgrown their dreams of becoming firemen or baseball players and settled for more mundane careers as accountants and insurance salesmen, Don Thompson continued in the pursuit of his lifelong ambition. He joined the Springwood Police Department right after being graduated from high school and quickly worked his way up through the ranks. By the time he earned his sergeant stripes, Don Thompson was happily married to his high school sweetheart and the father of a beautiful baby girl. Unfortunately, Marge Thompson soon discovered that the life of a police officer's wife was not nearly so exciting or glamorous as she had hoped. By the time Thompson made lieutenant, he was a divorcee with an ex-wife who drank too much and a beautiful teenage daughter whom he didn't see nearly so often as he wanted to. Thompson was dreaming about the old days, when he and Marge were still able to carry on a civil conversation when he was abruptly awakened by the emergency telephone call. He dressed quickly, gulped down a cup of coffee, and drove himself downtown to the police station. It was Jerry Parker, one of the new patrolmen, who met him at the door. "'What do you got?' asked Thompson, getting right down to business as usual. He would never admit it to anyone, but this was exactly the sort of case he used to fantasize about when he was a little boy, dreaming about growing up to be a cop. Murders didn't happen every day in quiet suburban communities like Springwood, and the ones that did were usually open and shut cases of a drunken husband shooting his wife over some real or imagined infidelity. 
Razor was the weapon, according to the coroner, said Parker, glancing at the report in his hand. Or Razor's, more likely. Looks like it was the victim's boyfriend that did it. Guy by the name of Lane? Lane? echoed the lieutenant, not sounding very surprised. Musician type, couple of priors for brawling, drunk and disorderly, a real troublemaker. Anyway, we got no parents to claim the body. According to the other kids, the father split a couple years back and the mother's in Vegas. We're trying to reach her now. Terrific, said the lieutenant as they reached the interrogation room. What the hell was she doing there? She lives there, said the puzzled patrolman. I don't mean her, said the lieutenant, sounding very annoyed. He turned to the girl who sat beside her mother in the brightly lit room. I mean you. Nancy Thompson looked up at her father. What was she doing there? he demanded, turning angrily at his ex-wife. Hello to you too, Donald, said Marge Thompson, a cigarette in her trembling hand. Marge, he replied, struggling to control his quick temper. He took a deep breath and looked at Nancy. How you doing, baby? he asked, forcing himself to smile. I'm okay, Dad, said Nancy, disturbed by her father's unconvincing smile. She wondered if she looked anywhere near as bad as she felt inside. That's good, said the lieutenant, exchanging a worried look with his ex-wife. Then he looked hard into Nancy's eyes and took another deep breath. As a police officer, he knew he needed to be patient and tactful in extracting the necessary information from the girl. But as a father, there were questions he wanted answers to right now. I don't want to get into this right now, he began. God knows you need time. He paused for a second, and suddenly the anger and frustration of the frightened father overwhelmed the cold detachment of the trained cop. But I'd sure like to know what the hell you were doing shacked up with three other kids in the middle of the night, especially when one of them is a lunatic delinquent like Rod Lane. Nancy recoiled as if she had been slapped. Rod's not a lunatic, she said, knowing even as she spoke how absurd her words must sound. You got a sane explanation for what he did, baby? Tell him how jealous Rod was, said Marge, placing a hand on her daughter's trembling shoulder. Tell him about the fight they had. It wasn't that serious, said Nancy quietly, slouching deeper in her chair as she struggled to make sense of the terrible thing that had happened that night. Not serious, said her mother. You don't think murder is serious? Then suddenly Nancy was sitting upright, her eyes flashing with indignation. Tina was my best friend in the whole world. How can you say I don't take her death seriously? she shouted. Marge nodded to indicate her apology, and Nancy continued in a softer tone. All I meant was that their fights weren't that serious. She was quiet for a moment, and then suddenly she remembered why Tina had asked her over in the first place. Tina dreamed this would happen, she whispered, more to herself than to her mother or father. What? She had a nightmare about somebody trying to kill her. That's why we were there. She was scared to sleep alone. Of all the... The lieutenant began, but Marge cut him off in mid-sentence. Nancy's been through enough for one night, she said. You have her statement. Then, ignoring her ex-husband's glare, she took her daughter's hand and stood up. Thompson was about to order them to sit down and then thought better of it. He would have a long talk with Marge about the way she was bringing up their daughter, but this was clearly neither the time nor the place for that particular discussion. Don Thompson was on the phone with his ex-wife early the next morning, while Nancy stood transfixed in front of the television and listened to the local news. In the headlines this morning, said the announcer, the brutal murder of a local teenage girl at an all-night party in Springwood. Police say the victim, 15-year-old Tina Gray, had been arguing with her boyfriend shortly before last night's bloody slaying. The boyfriend, Rod Lane, is now the subject of a citywide manhunt. According to police, the murder weapon appears to have been a straight razor or similar sharp object. 
I have to go, said Marge, promptly hanging up the phone as she rushed to turn off the television. She arrived too late to stop Nancy from seeing the film of the body bag being carried from Tina's house to the coroner's van. Marge wondered how much of his influence her ex-husband had used to keep their daughter's name out of the story and the reporters away from their door. "'Don't go to school today, kiddo,' she said, taking Nancy in her arms and giving her a quick hug. "'You need your sleep. I heard you tossing and turning all night.' "'I've got to go to school, mother,' said Nancy, gently freeing herself from her mother's embrace. "'Otherwise, I'll sit up there and go crazy.' "'Did you sleep at all?' I'll sleep in study hall, Nancy promised. I'd rather keep busy, you know. Marge nodded and kissed Nancy on the forehead. Sometimes she wished she were as good as her daughter was at handling difficulties. For Marge, booze had always seemed like the easiest way to make troubles disappear. Come right home after, she said. Right home, Nancy promised, hugging her mother one more time before picking up her books and heading off for school. Nancy had only walked a few blocks when she began to get the feeling that she was being watched. She turned around and noticed a tall man in dark glasses standing across the street. For a second, she thought she saw the man staring at her. My best friend just got killed, she thought. I guess I'm entitled to be a little jumpy. She took a few more steps and then glanced back over her shoulder. The man with the dark glasses was gone. Don't be paranoid, she told herself although she couldn't imagine how the man had managed to disappear so abruptly. Then she took a deep breath of the fresh morning air and walked a little more quickly toward Springwood High. She was only a block away from school when a strong hand clamped over her mouth and she was dragged into the bushes. Nancy had barely begun to struggle when she realized she was being held by Rod Lane. Don't scream, he whispered. I'm not going to hurt you. He waited until Nancy stopped struggling before removing his hand from her mouth. Your old man thinks I did it, didn't he? Did you? asked Nancy, as calmly as she could with her heart pounding like a jackhammer. Of course not, said Rod angrily. I never touched her. You were screaming like a madman. Someone else was there, he said, knowing even as he spoke how crazy he must have sounded. Nancy looked at Rod for a long moment and shook her head. Instinctively, she knew he was telling the truth, and yet... The front door was still locked when the police came, she said, trying very hard to make sense of Rod's story. And the bedroom door was locked from your side. Don't look at me like I'm some kind of fruitcake, said Rod. I swear, I never hurt Tina. Nancy nodded and was about to say that she believed him when she realized he was staring over her shoulder. "'Good morning, Rod,' said a familiar voice. Nancy turned to see her father standing behind her, with his police thirty-eight pointed squarely between Rod's eyes. "'Now just move away from her, son. Really easy, like your ass depended on it.' Rod looked at Nancy for just a second, and then lunged wildly out of the bushes. Nancy stared in horror as her father raised his revolver to a firing position. No! she screamed, jumping between Rod and her father. Are you crazy? shouted Thompson, pushing Nancy aside as he took off after Rod. The chase was a short one. Rod had already been wrestled to the ground by the tall man in the dark glasses. Even as two uniformed policemen roughly shoved Rod into the squad car, Nancy could hear the boy insisting that he hadn't done anything. She waited until the car door slammed before turning angrily to her father. You used me? She said. What the hell did you expect? He asked, bewildered and more than a little annoyed by his daughter's attitude. And what are you doing in school today anyway? Nancy thought of a thousand things she wanted to say, but none of them seemed to express exactly what was in her heart at that moment. Instead, she simply turned away and strode briskly toward the school building. "'Hey, Nancy!' the lieutenant shouted, but his daughter ignored him and kept on walking. He stood there staring and wondering what in the hell was going on. "'Guess I'll never understand women,' thought Don Thompson, as he turned around and walked slowly toward his car. <laughs>
Chapter 4 It was hard enough to stay awake in Mrs. Solomon's English class under the best of circumstances. After two sleepless nights and the murder of her best friend, Nancy was finding it just about impossible to keep her eyes open. Mrs. Solomon was reading a passage from Julius Caesar, and Nancy tried very hard to stifle Leon. She was a good English student, but somehow she had never been able to warm up to Shakespeare. If only he had written in plain English and left out all those methinks and forsooths. In the most high and palmy state of Rome, read the teacher, her voice rising and falling dramatically as if to remind the class that they were listening to great poetry. A little ere the mightiest Julius fell. Nancy jerked her head up, suddenly realizing that her eyes had closed for just a moment. The grave stood tintinless, Mrs. Solomon continued, and the sheeted dead did squeak and gibber in the Roman street. Squeak and gibber? Nancy silently repeated, her head now resting comfortably on her upturned palm. She wondered how much longer it would be until study hall. It would be so nice to sit in the back of the auditorium with her eyes closed, maybe even to take a little nap before her next class. She closed her eyes for just a second, her breath slow and steady as the teacher droned on from the front of the room. Then she heard someone softly call her name, and her eyes snapped open. Tina? she whispered. She looked out into the hallway through the open classroom door and saw the body bag. It was the same size and shape as the bag she had seen on television, but it seemed to be moving ever so slightly. Nancy shook her head and wiped the sleep from her eyes with the back of her hand. When she looked again, the bag was gone. In its place was a long, dark smear of dried blood. Oh, God, continued Mrs. Solomon, I could be bounded in a nutshell and count myself a king of infinite space were it not that I have had bad dreams. Bad dreams? echoed Nancy silently, slipping out of her seat. No one paid any attention as she turned and strode purposefully out of the room. Then she heard Tina call her name once more. There, at the end of the hall, was the body bag. One pale hand hanging out through the partially open zipper. Nancy watched as the bag slowly slid out of sight, leaving a dark trail of slime in its wake. Tina! she called, racing down the hall and around the corner. She didn't see the hall monitor coming the other way until the two girls collided and fell to the floor. No running in the halls, said the girl with the oversized badge pinned to her sweater as Nancy rose quickly to her feet. Let me see your pass. Nancy looked down the hall and saw the body bag sliding slowly down a dimly lit corridor that she couldn't quite remember ever having seen before. Screw your pass, Nancy said pushing the other girl out of the way as she watched the bag turn into a narrow doorway. Nancy raced down the hall in time to hear the bag tumbling down a long flight of stairs. Hey! yelled the hall monitor. Nancy turned and saw that the girl was now bleeding profusely from her eyes and ears. There was a smile on the girl's blood-smeared face and a wicked look in her eyes as she waved at Nancy. No running in the halls, she said her fingers tipped with long, razor-sharp knives. Nancy turned away in horror, stepping through the doorway. She saw a long, narrow stairway and heard a steady throbbing noise from down below. Nancy hesitated for only a second and then followed the trail of slime down the stairs. She was in a boiler room, but it was like no boiler room she had ever seen before, except perhaps in a vaguely remembered dream. There was something frighteningly oversized about everything in the room, from the rumbling machinery itself to the seemingly endless network of tunnels, ladders, and catwalks. And everywhere there was steam, hot and suffocating. Nancy stood perfectly still and wiped the sweat from her forehead, while her eyes slowly adjusted to the dim orange light that emanated from deep within the bowels of the massive boiler. And suddenly she heard it, the horrible screeching of metal on metal that she still remembered so clearly from her last nightmare. Who are you? she demanded, turning to face the man she knew she would see, the man in the dirty sweater and the deadly finger knives. But the man didn't answer. 
he only smiled as he slowly raked his razor-sharp nails across his own chest. Nancy gagged in disgust as the skin slowly parted to release a yellow fluid squirming with hundreds of tiny worms and maggots. And then the chase was on. Nancy was running as fast as she could through a maze of steaming pipes. But the man with the razor blade fingers was never more than a few steps behind. The opening seemed to be growing smaller and smaller as Nancy weaved her way through the labyrinth. She heard her own loud breathing and the pounding of her heart. And she knew she couldn't run much longer. Ahead of her was a brick wall and behind her the maniac with his blades of death. Nancy looked desperately to the left and to the right, but there seemed to be no escape. She stopped, her back to the wall and nowhere left to run. The madman stood before her, a twisted smile of victory on his ugly mouth as he flashed his blades in front of Nancy's face. There must be some way out of this nightmare, thought Nancy, refusing even at this terrifying moment to give up hope. The nightmare, she repeated, something strange and almost unfathomable suddenly clicking into place in her mind. Then, taking a deep breath, Nancy wheeled around and pressed her right forearm against one of the scalding steam pipes. The pain was unlike anything she had ever felt, and her own scream echoed over and over again in her head as she fell to her knees in agony. And then she was on her feet, only she was no longer in some dank and steamy boiler room, Rather, she was back in Mrs. Solomon's English class, standing beside her desk, with her books clattering noisily to the floor. "'Are you all right?' asked Mrs. Solomon, rushing to the girl's side. Nancy looked around, still groggy from her nightmare, and discovered that every eye in the class was on her. She whirled around and stared at the open classroom door, half expecting to find the man with the finger knife standing there, laughing his horrible, raspy laugh. The hallway was empty. "'I'll call your mother,' said Mrs. Solomon, bending down to help Nancy retrieve her books. "'No!' said the girl with more emphasis than she had intended. "'No, really. I'm all right. I'll just go home.' She grabbed her books from the startled teacher and hurried quickly out the door. "'You'll need a hall pass!' shouted Mrs. Solomon. But Nancy was already out of earshot. She didn't stop walking until she was out of the building. When she reached the clump of bushes that Rod had pulled her into that morning to protest his innocence, Nancy stopped, put down her books, and rested against the coal bark of a nearby tree. "'I'm not going to cry,' she said out loud. She took a deep breath and forced herself to think back to the terrible nightmare. It didn't seem so bad remembering that horrible boiler room when she was standing in the light of day, breathing the fresh afternoon air. Still, the dream had seemed so incredibly real, and wasn't it just like the dream Tina had described the other day? It was all so weird, but Nancy was determined to find a logical explanation. There's nothing to be afraid of, she whispered to herself. After all, a nightmare couldn't really hurt anybody, could it? It wasn't until she reached down to pick up her books that Nancy saw the fresh scald mark on her right forearm. Is my dad there? Nancy asked the burly desk sergeant at the police station. Despite her promise, Nancy had not gone directly home. Instead, she had taken the bus to the police station where Rod Lane was being held on suspicion of murder. The sergeant looked at Nancy for a mo moment and nodded, recognizing the same no-nonsense tone of voice he had so often heard from her father. The sergeant picked up his telephone and a moment later, Don Thompson stepped out of his office. "'Taking the day off after all?' he asked, smiling at Nancy. He stopped smiling when he saw the grimly determined look on the girl's face. "'Dad, I want to see Rod Lane.' "'Only family allowed, honey. You know the rules.' "'I just want to talk to him for a second. "'The kid's dangerous. You don't know that he did it.' "'No, I don't know for sure,' the lieutenant conceded. 
What I do know is that he was in a locked room last night with a girl who went in alive and came out in a rubber bag. Nancy flinched as if she had been struck. I just want to talk to him, she said. Please, Dad. Her voice now soft and pleading. Lieutenant Thompson glanced at the sergeant. The man behind the big oak desk shrugged his shoulders and quickly looked away. You can't always go by the book, Thompson reminded himself. It was a principle that Marge had often insisted upon during the last stormy years of their marriage. Make it fast, he said, calling for a patrolman to show Nancy to the holding cell. Tell me everything that happened last night, said Nancy when she was alone with Rod, and for the next several minutes, Rod did exactly that. That's crazy, said Nancy when the boy finished his story. You think I don't know that? he said, jumping nervously to his feet and pacing the small cell. Nancy thought he looked more like a trapped animal than a human being. How could somebody get into bed and under the covers with you guys not knowing it? she asked. How the fuck do I know? It was obviously a question to which Rod had given a great deal of unproductive thought. I don't expect you to believe me anyways. Did you get a look at him? No. Then how do you know somebody was there? Because I saw him cut her, Rod yelled. A guard poked his head into the cell, and Nancy waved him away. Somebody cut her while you watched, she said quietly. But you don't know what he looked like? Rod paused and then stared at the wall as he spoke. You couldn't see the fucker, he said, his voice low and seemingly far away. You could just see the cuts happening all at once. He cut her and dragged her around up the wall over the ceiling. He paused and swallowed and Nancy saw that there were tears in his eyes. And then he just, he just dropped her and there was blood, blood everywhere. He stopped again and looked at Nancy, his eyes begging her to believe him. Tell me about the cuts, said Nancy, trying hard to control the tremble in her voice. It's like I said. It was as if there were four straight razors all cutting her at the same time, but the razors were invisible. She, she, she just opened up. He stopped suddenly and smashed his fist against the wall, his eyes now filled with tears. I couldn't save her, he said, gasping for breath. I could have, I could have moved faster, only I was, I was sure it was just another nightmare. Nightmare? echoed Nancy. Yeah, like the one I had before. There was this guy who had knives for fingers. Nancy turned and grabbed hold of the bars, her knuckles white as she squeezed with all her might to keep from crying out loud. There was a long silence before Rod spoke again. You think I did it? he asked. No, she said. I only wish I did, she thought as the guard unlocked the door. Chapter 5 Nancy Thompson soaked peacefully in the bathtub with her eyes closed and prayed that the hot, sudsy water could somehow soothe away all of her cares. The last couple of days had been some of the longest and strangest days of her life, and not getting any sleep was definitely not helping her jangled nerves. It was so pleasant lying in the tub. Nancy felt as if she could almost forget about Tina and Rod and the man in the nightmare if she could just drift off into a long, peaceful slumber. Already, she could begin to feel reality fading quietly away as she slipped into a light, blissful sleep. Nancy? Nancy's eyes snapped open at the sound of her mother's voice, calling her name from the other side of the door. What is it? she asked, feeling somewhat annoyed at having been so abruptly awoken. Don't fall asleep in there, said her mother. People drown in the bathtub every day, you know. Oh, mother, said Nancy. I wasn't actually falling asleep, she assured herself. There's a big difference between falling asleep and resting your eyes. I've got some warm milk for you, her mother continued. Why don't you get out of there and jump into bed? I'll be out in a few minutes, said Nancy. She waited until her mother walked away before adding, Warm milk, 
gross. I suppose I really should be getting out, thought Nancy as she settled back to enjoy one more relaxing minute in the tub. She closed her eyes again and began to sing softly the counting song she and the other neighborhood children used to sing when they were very small. One, two, Freddy's coming for you. Three, four, better lock your door. She stopped and yawned. The warm water felt so nice. And suddenly something was dragging her under the water. She tried to grab onto the sides of the tub, only it felt more like being in a bottomless well than a bathtub. Down and down she went until she could no longer see the surface of the tub. Kicking wildly, she struggled to free herself from whatever diabolical force was pulling her ever downward, trying to drown her in the cold, dark waters. She wanted to scream for help, but she knew that her only chance was to hold her breath for as long as she could and somehow fight her way back up to the light. Her lungs aching, she thrust her shoulders forward and arched her back, determined to save herself at any cost. This can't be happening, she told herself over and over again, as if her believing it was all a dream would somehow make a difference. And then she heard her mother's voice calling out her name. The voice was muffled and indistinct, but it was clear enough to serve as a precious link between Nancy and the world outside her nightmare. With one last burst of willpower, Nancy thrust her head and shoulders above the surface of the water and opened her eyes wide. Mommy! She cried, gasping and choking as she filled her aching lungs with air. Her mother was kneeling at the side of the tub now, cradling her daughter's head in her arms as she began to wrap her with a large towel. "'Are you okay?' asked Marge, rubbing Nancy gently with the towel. Nancy nodded, gazing in bewilderment at the tub that seemed only moments ago to be b a bottomless pit. "'Time to get in bed, young lady,' said her mother, "'and I don't want to hear any argument.' "'Okay, Mom,' said Nancy, still struggling to catch her breath. "'Let me, let me finish drying off, and I'll be out in a minute.' "'Promise?' "'Promise,' said Nancy. "'Her mother paused for just a moment and then left the room. "'Nancy was putting on her robe a few minutes later "'when she noticed the dark scald mark on her right forearm. "'She gazed at it for a long time "'and then turned unhesitantly to the medicine cabinet. "'It only took her a few seconds to find the box of no-dos "'and slip it into the pocket of her robe. "'And no school tomorrow either,' said her mother "'as she escorted Nancy to her room. I want you to relax and get some rest. Okay, Mom, said Nancy, thinking that a little rest sounded awfully good. Take this. Her mother handed her a small yellow pill and a glass of water. It'll help you sleep. Nancy looked at her mother for a moment and then took the pill. She put it in her mouth and then swallowed the water. Sleep tight, said Marge, looking very relieved as she kissed her daughter on the forehead. Things will look brighter in the morning. Nancy said good night and waited for her mother to leave the room. As soon as the bedroom door was closed, she spit the yellow pill into her hand and tossed it out the window. Then she popped a couple of no-dose tablets into her mouth, turned on her bedside lamp, and settled back for what promised to be a very long night. <laughs> It was a little after midnight when Nancy heard the noise. Slowly, as if in a dream, she climbed out of bed and walked toward the window. It was a windy night, and Nancy could hear the rustling of the curtains in the window across the street as they blew gently in the cool night breeze. And then someone appeared out of the darkness. His hand clamped onto Nancy's mouth to muffle her scream. She was about to sink her teeth into the hand as hard as she could when she suddenly recognized a familiar class ring. "'It's me,' whispered Glenn, taking his hand away from her mouth. "'I saw your light was on, so I thought I'd see how you were doing.' Nancy took a deep, calming breath and shook her head slowly from side to side. "'Sometimes I wish you didn't live right across the street,' she said. Actually, she was very glad to see Glenn at that moment. "'Shut up and let me in already,' said Glenn, climbing through the window. "'You ever try balancing on a rose trellis on a windy night?' He entered the room and plopped down on the bed. 
if you don't mind, said Nancy, pointing at the chair, with a slight smile on her face. So, said Glenn, moving quickly to the chair, I understand you freaked out in English today. Nancy glanced at the door to make sure her mother hadn't heard. Guess I did, she admitted. Haven't slept, have you? Not really. What did you do to your arm? asked Glenn. Burned myself in English class, she replied. Nancy looked at herself in the mirror and winced. My God, she said, I look twenty years old. And that's when the plan began to take shape in Nancy's mind. Listen, she said, I've got a crazy favor to ask. Uh-oh, said Glenn. It's nothing hard. I'm just going to look for someone, and I need you to stand guard, okay? Sure, said Glenn doubtfully, I think. Listen, said Nancy, coming very close. This is very important, and I don't want you to screw up. A whole lot might depend on it. I won't screw up, said Glenn. When did I ever screw up? Just pay attention and listen, said Nancy, ignoring his question. She climbed back into bed and turned out the light. Here's what we're going to do. It's dark in here, Glenn interrupted, a mischievous grin on his face. And it's not what you're thinking, said Nancy, as she began to explain her plan. Nancy is walking down Elm Street in her nightgown. The wind is howling, but Nancy doesn't feel cold. She is strangely exhilarated like a hunter in search of prey, but she feels the fear of the prey as well. With each step she takes, she is prepared for the sudden lunge of a madman from behind a tree or a bush, but she is literally too tired to hide any longer. Besides, she knows that she is not alone. Are you still there, Glenn? She whispers, and she hears the boy's reassuring reply as if from a great distance. Onward into the night she goes, and soon she is no longer walking past the neatly manicured lawns of suburban Springwood. It's darker now, and there's an alley up ahead. She hesitates for just a moment, and then enters deeper into the shadows in determined pursuit of her quarry. At any moment she expects to see the flashing of razor-sharp blades, and she prays that she can do what needs to be done before it's too late. But nothing happens. And for a moment, Nancy thinks that the waiting is no less terrifying than the confrontation that she both yearns for and fears. Glenn, she whispers. There is no answer. Glenn, she repeats a little bit louder as a drop of sweat drips off the tip of her nose. I'm here, says the voice, but this time it is followed by a loud yawn. Stay awake, Nancy commands, but Glenn doesn't reply. Suddenly, she is standing in front of the police station. There's a light on in the basement, and Nancy moves closer to peer inside. The window is barred, and through the window, she sees Rod Lane sleeping on a hard cot. He's tossing and turning, as if in the middle of some terrible nightmare. Nancy calls his name, trying to wake him, but it's of no use. He can't hear her. And then someone is inside the cell with him, and Nancy knows at once exactly who it is. Glenn, she says in a loud whisper, but there is no reply. She calls his name again, but hears only the soft, steady sound of his snoring. And inside the cell, the man with the dirty sweater and the battered fedora is holding Rod's bedsheet in his powerful hands, twisting it carefully into an instrument of death as he steps slowly toward the boy's sleeping form. Without thinking, Nancy begins pounding on the glass behind the bars. Watch out! She screams. Rod rolls over with a troubled groan as the madman's eyes shift to the girl outside the cell. They are ugly, piggish eyes, and they are filled with a loathing beyond anything in Nancy's wildest imagination. As the monster takes a step toward Nancy, Rod sits up and opens his eyes. Suddenly, the madman is gone. Nancy screams Rod's name again, but the boy never looks in her direction. Instead, he throws himself back down on the cot and pulls the thin cover back over his broad shoulders. And there, once again, standing in the shadows, is the man with the red and green sweater, the twisted sheet 
clenched tightly in his hands. Suddenly, Nancy turns around and sees Tina, staring at her from inside a body bag. The dead girl opens her mouth to speak, but only a long black centipede slithers out of her mouth. Nancy looks down to avoid her friend's dead eyes and sees an oozing mask of slimy snakes and eels swarming at the girl's feet. Glenn! She screams, turning her eyes away in disgust. She calls his name again, and this time there is a reply. The voice comes from directly behind her, but it's not the voice of Glenn Lance. I'm here! Croaks the madman, his foul breath hot on Nancy's exposed neck. Nancy pitches back just in time to avoid the deadly swoop of the creature's finger knives, and then she begins to run, screaming Glenn's name over and over again, but knowing that he won't answer. Knowing that he is finally screwed up when it really counted. And Nancy runs. She runs through city streets and down narrow alleyways, and always the man with the finger knives is running right behind. Her heart and lungs bursting, Nancy finds herself running down suburban streets that seem strangely familiar and yet totally alien at the same time. For a moment she thinks she sees her house, but it is merely some colonial style house with well cared for lawn like millions of such homes in suburban communities all over the damn country. If I can get home, I'll be safe, Nancy tells herself, although she knows there is no logical basis for her belief. Still with death just a few feet behind, a girl has to believe in something if she's going to survive. And then Nancy is on her own front lawn and racing toward the door. I don't have keys, she thinks, convinced for just a moment that the end is finally at hand. But the door is unlocked, and Nancy pushes it open before throwing all of her weight against the inside of the door and locking both locks from the inside. Glenn! she yells, but again she hears only his persistent snoring. Nancy looks at herself in the hallway mirror. Her face is dirty and smeared with sweat and tears. She is still breathing hard, and her pulse races, but she is beginning to feel as if maybe she is safe at last. And then the silence of the night is broken by a terrible scraping sound at the window and Nancy sees the madman scratching at the glass with his incredibly sharp blades. To her horror, the glass gives way at the edges, and the leering madman pushes the rest of the window out of the frame with a frightening crash. Jesus, says Nancy out loud as she runs up the stairs for the safety of her own private room. But the floor beneath her feet is no longer the solid surface it had always been before. The soft, shaggy carpeting on the stairway has turned to something with the disgusting texture of quicksand, clinging to her ankles like warm molasses, slowing her movements to an agonizing crawl just when speed is most of the essence. Struggling slowly up the stairs with gooey globs of slime grabbing at her ankles, Nancy hears the madman push his way through the window and stagger noisily across the living room. And then she's in her room, the door securely locked behind her. She puts her ear to the door. Silence. This is just a dream, she reminds herself, glancing at a reflection in the full-length mirror on her closet door. And then Nancy's image shatters into a thousand pieces as the mad killer crashes through the mirror and seizes her by the throat amidst a shower of broken glass. They fall back on the bed, Nancy summoning every ounce of strength at her command to hold back the wrist of the killer's knife hand, its glittering blades just an inch from her throat. Nancy looks at the man's face, twisted with hate despite his sadistic grin, and senses that he is just playing with her, that he can break away from her grasp and slit her throat at any moment that he might choose. Suddenly, she lets go of his hand. She rolls away just as the deadly blades come down and slice through her new feather pillow. Feathers fly everywhere as Nancy rolls off the bed searching for a corner of sanctuary in her once safe and familiar room. The madman seems unperturbed by this blizzard of feathers that fill the room as he grabs Nancy by the wrist, knocking over the night table at the side of her bed as they tumble roughly to the floor. She is pinned beneath him now with no escape. 
She looks into his hideous face and sees a look of triumph on his scarred features that fills her with loathing. His deadly blades just an inch from her eyes. Nancy quickly decides upon her final act in life and spits in the madman's face. Die! He whispers, and Nancy is prepared to do exactly that when the alarm clock at her side suddenly goes off with a deafening ring. Nancy opened her eyes to find herself in bed. She looked around wildly before reaching over to turn off the alarm clock. In the chair next to the bed, Glenn sat up and wiped the sleep from his eyes. "'You bastard!' said Nancy, glaring at Glenn, with the fury greater than any she had ever known before in her life. "'What, what did I do?' asked Glenn, truly bewildered by the anger and hurt in Nancy's voice. He reached out to her, but she pulled away and flattened herself against the wall. "'I ask you to do one simple thing.' she said, her voice and eyes hard. Just stay awake and watch me. Just wake me if it looks like I'm having a bad dream. She paused and shook her head, overwhelmed by the enormity of Glenn's incompetence. And what do you do? You fall asleep. Glenn gazed at her in silence, unsure of what words to offer in his own defense. He was about to apologize when he heard Nancy's mother calling the girl's name. Shit! he said, and dashed out the window just as Nancy's mother appeared at the bedroom door. "'Are you okay?' Marge asked. Nancy paused and took a deep, calming breath before making her reply. "'I'm all right,' she said. "'I just had a little dream.' "'Okay,' said her mother doubtfully. "'If you need anything, just call.' "'Okay, Mom. Good night.' Marge said good night and closed the door behind her. Nancy waited until she heard her mother's footsteps fade away before sitting up and glancing out the window. Glenn, she said, but all she saw was a single bone-white feather floating by in the moonlight. Chapter 6 I have to see Rod Lane right now, said Nancy. The burly desk sergeant looked at her for a long moment and then looked at Glenn standing beside her. The boy looked as if he had no idea what he was doing in the police station in the middle of the night. When I took the night shift, said the sergeant with a weary sigh, I thought I'd have some peace and quiet for a change. It's urgent, said Nancy. I have to see Rod right away. The sergeant glanced at the clock on the wall over the door. It's three o'clock in the morning, he said. Your mother know you're out this late? Nancy was about to make up some sort of story when she saw her father emerge from his office with the styrofoam cup of black coffee in his hand. Daddy, she said, what are you doing here? It happens that I work here. There's an unsolved murder investigation going on and I don't much care for unsolved murders, especially ones that my daughter's mixed up in. The question is, what the hell are you doing here at this hour? Nancy had a nightmare, said Glenn. She says Rod's in some kind of trouble, and his voice trailed off as his eyes met Lieutenant Thompson's icy stare. I just want to see if he's okay, Nancy told her father, her gaze unyielding and deadly serious. The guy's sleeping like a baby, said the lieutenant, glancing briefly at his watch. Believe me, Nancy, your friend Rod isn't going anywhere tonight. Just check, Daddy, she pleaded. That's all I'm asking. Lieutenant Thompson looked hard at his daughter and then glanced at the sergeant. It had been a long day and a longer night, and the lieutenant was looking forward to going home and getting a good night's sleep. Obviously, he wasn't going anywhere until Nancy was safe and sound back on Elm Street. Just one look, he said at last. And then I'm personally driving you back home, baby. He nodded to the sergeant, who immediately opened the top drawer of his desk. Now where the hell did I put that key? The sergeant muttered as he fumbled around in the open drawer. And while the sergeant looked for the key, Rod Lane slept in a locked cell in the back of the police station. His rest was an uneasy one. For Rod was in the middle of a nightmare. 
Only this nightmare was more real, more terrifying than any nightmare Rod had ever had before. This nightmare was about a deformed madman who wore a dirty sweater and a crumpled hat and had only one obsessive thought in his twisted mind. The madman wanted Rod dead. And in his dream, Rod fought mightily with the man in the red and green sweater, knowing even as he struggled that his own mortal strength was no match for that of the maniac who was determined to take his life. If Lieutenant Thompson had arrived a few moments earlier, he would have seen Rod's bedsheet begin to move as if it had life of its own. He would have watched in stunned disbelief as the sheet slithered like some deadly snake, twisting tighter and tighter, as it inched ever closer to the sleeping figure then forming itself into a noose and slipping gently around Rod's throat, tightening suddenly around his windpipe with a terrible snap as it jerked the boy upright in bed, his face contorted in a grotesque mask of frozen agony. Instead, Nancy and Glenn and the two policemen arrived at the cell just in time to find Rod Lane's lifeless body hanging from the bar of the high window. Shit, said Glenn, turning almost as pale as the sheet knotted tightly around Rod's broken neck. Give me a hand, said Lieutenant Thompson, rushing into the cell to cut the boy down. Together, Glenn and the two policemen lowered Rod's body and arranged it carefully on the unmade cot from which it had been roughly dragged by unseen hands only moments before. Nancy's father looked at his daughter with an expression halfway between anger and total bewilderment. After all his years on the force, Don Thompson was sure that he knew a potential suicide when he saw one, and Rod Lane hadn't fit that pattern at all. "'How did you know this was going to happen?' he asked, but Nancy only gazed silently into the darkness. Despite her parents' objections, Nancy joined the small crowd of mourners who attended Rod's funeral later that week. It was a rainy morning and the mud stuck to Nancy's shoes as she made her way across the wet ground. For some reason, she found herself thinking of the staircase at home. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust, the minister droned on and on, but nobody seemed to be paying much attention to what he was saying. Rod had never been the sort of boy who attended church, and Nancy doubted that he would have approved of the Bible-quoting minister who now presided over his funeral. "'He who lives by the sword shall die by the sword,' said the minister, as Nancy spotted Tina's mother in the back of the crowd. Nancy wondered if Mrs. Gray really believed that it had been Rod's switchblade knife that had brought her daughter's life to such a bloody end. "'And may Rod rest in peace.' the minister concluded. Nancy stepped forward and tossed a handful of dirt into the shallow hole that would be Rod's resting place for eternity. Or until the worms finish with him, thought Nancy with a grim smile as she watched the casket being lowered into the ground. Time to go home, said Marge Thompson, gently taking her daughter by the hand. Nancy looked at her parents, silently noting that it had taken the murder of two of her friends to bring the three of them together again as a family. They walked toward the station wagon in silence, and it was not until Marge opened the door that Nancy finally spoke the thought that had been on her mind ever since she saw Rod's body hanging in the police station cell. "'The killer's still loose, you know.' "'What are you talking about?' asked Marge, convinced that a good night's sleep was all Nancy really needed. "'Are you saying somebody else killed Tina?' asked Lieutenant Thompson. He was still trying to figure out how his daughter had foreseen Rod's suicide. Nancy stared off into the distance and shrugged her shoulders. "'I don't know who he is,' she said, "'but he's burned, and he wears a weird hat and a dirty red and green sweater.' "'Go on,' said Thompson.' his face suddenly drained of color. "'And he's got these knives,' Nancy continued. "'Only they're more like some kind of fingernails.' She looked at her mother, who had turned as pale as her ex-husband. "'And he's trying to kill me, just like he killed Tina and Rod,' Nancy added, her voice hoarse and trembling. "'I think you'd better stay home for a few days, baby,' said the lieutenant in a very low voice. Marge nodded in agreement." 
It won't do any good, said Nancy, a weird sort of smile on her face. I keep dreaming about this guy, just the way Tina did, and probably the way Rod did, too. Tina dreamed he was going to get her, and he did. Now he's after me. She paused and looked into her father's eyes. Will you find him, Daddy? Please. He's going to get me if you don't stop him. The lieutenant looked at Marge, cleared his throat, and then looked away. Marge took Nancy in her arms and whispered softly into her ear. We're going to help you, baby, she said. No one is going to threaten you any more. Daddy, said Nancy, as her mother ushered her into the front seat of the car and started the engine. She was still looking into her father's distant eyes as the car slowly pulled away from the cemetery. The Katya Institute for the Study of Sleep Disorders was a relatively new division of the university's world-renowned school of medicine. Under the very capable leadership of its young founder and director, Dr. Samuel King, the institute was quickly achieve, achieving well-deserved fame of its own as the front-runner in the rapidly expanding specialty of sleep-related pathologies. Nancy Thompson was not at all unhappy about finding herself lying on a very comfortable bed in one of the Institute's carefully designed sleep chambers. Despite the various electrodes and sensors that were fastened to her head and body, Nancy was looking forward to closing her eyes under the watchful gaze of the kind-looking Dr. King and finally getting the sleep that her body so desperately yearned for. "'Don't worry,' said Dr. King as the nurse finished applying the last of the electrodes. You're not going to turn into the Bride of Frankenstein or anything. Nancy smiled, hoping that they would soon get to the part of the experiment where she actually got to close her eyes and go to sleep. Dr. King glanced at his clipboard and then turned to Nancy's mother. Did Nancy have any uh, severe childhood illness, scarlet fever, high temperatures, uh, concussions? No, nothing said Marge, sounding almost apologetic. He means, said Nancy, smiling at her mother, did you ever drop me on my head? The doctor laughed, but Marge only shook her head as if unaware that Nancy was joking. Nightmares are often the natural byproduct of psychological trauma, Dr. King explained, speaking to both Nancy and her mother. They almost always fade in time. I don't see why you can't just give me some kind of pill to keep me from dreaming said Nancy. She was beginning to believe that dreamless sleep was the next best thing to paradise. We all need to dream, Nancy, said the doctor. We've tried depriving volunteers of dreams, and they usually get very, very weird. I never used to dream much, said Nancy. Everyone dreams every night, whether they remember their dreams or not, Dr. King replied. We don't know why yet, but dreaming is something we just have to do. The doctor paused, checked his clipboard, and then looked at Nancy again. I guess we're just about ready to begin now. We'll be right here, said Marge, squeezing her daughter's hand. There's nothing to worry about. Please trust us. It's not you I don't trust, said Nancy. It's just... She stopped in mid-sentence and shrugged. There was no point in trying to explain again. Let's do it, she said. Her mother smiled weakly and kissed Nancy one more time before following Dr. King out of the sleep chamber and into the observation room. She gazed at her daughter through the one-way mirror while the doctor checked the readings on a panel of glowing dials and gauges. "'Everything seems perfectly normal so far,' he said, making a slight adjustment on one of his instruments. Marge noticed that his manner was a bit more somber now that Nancy was out of earshot. How long has all this been going on, exactly? Since the murder, said Marge. She was fine before that now. Now she seems to think her dreams are well, real. Do you know the old Buddhist tale about the king who dreamed he was a beggar, who dreamed he was a king? Asked the doctor, his eyes fixed on Nancy as she began to fall asleep on the other side of the glass. Half of what our uh, ancestors believe today, we think is utter nonsense. Flat earth dragons, demons, who's to say that our great-great-grandchildren are merely part of some greater reality? 
He glanced at Marge for just a second before looking back at his instrument panel. Good. She's asleep. Thank God, said Marge, looking for the first time at the battery of meters, gauges, and graphs that were tracing her daughter's various vital functions while she slept. We're monitoring her brain waves with extreme accuracy, said Dr. King, pointing vaguely at one of the lighted dials. As soon as she starts dreaming, we'll know exactly what's going on. Marge sat back in her chair and took out a pack of cigarettes. She noticed Dr. King's disapproving look and put the cigarettes back in her purse. "'What the hell are dreams anyway?' she asked, largely to divert herself from her powerful nicotine craving. "'Mysteries,' said Dr. King. "'The truth is we really don't know what they are or where they come from. "'As for nightmares,' he paused and shrugged his shoulders. "'In any event,' he continued, there seem to be no signs of abnormality in Nancy's EEG or pulse rate. I'd guess that what we have here is a normal young girl who just happens to have gone through a couple of days of hell. Marge gazed through the window to see Nancy peacefully sleeping and wondered if maybe she hadn't been making a big fuss over nothing at all. Here we go, said Dr. King. Marge looked to where he was pointing and saw a needle move all the way to the left. She's entering deep sleep now. Her heart rate's a little high, but that's that's just due to anxiety. This is the phase of sleep where dreams take place. He paused and smiled. Just about now, I feel like I'm monitoring a diver on the bottom of an unmapped sea. Marge watched as her daughter's face relaxed, the tension gone from her shoulders, as she curled into an almost fetal-like ball. She's starting to dream now, said the doctor, his eyes glued to the close-up of Nancy's face on the video monitor next to the control panel. See the rapid eye movements? The eyes actually move to follow the action in the dream. He paused, glanced at one of the gauges, and made a note on his pad. Beta waves are slowing too. See this graph here? Marge reluctantly looked away from her daughter's sleeping figure to glance at the slowly moving graph beside the monitor. Do you notice how the needle fluctuates between plus and minus three? Those are typical dream parameters. A nightmare might read plus or minus five, maybe six at the outside. Right now, suddenly the doctor stopped and tapped the gauge with his finger. Marge looked out and saw Nancy straining to sit up, her neck stretched forward like that of an animal preparing to flee from a predator. What's she doing? Marge demanded but the doctor was still staring at his instruments in disbelief. The needle on the graph was reading plus eight and still climbing. And then a scream of terror penetrated the thick glass, and a dozen red and green lights began to flash on the instrument panel. In the sleep chamber, Nancy's body had arced upward, twisting and turning as if jolted by a massive voltage of electricity. Oh my God! cried Marge, but Dr. King was already out the door and standing at Nancy's side. He grabbed her by the arm and tried to shake her awake, but Nancy continued to scream and flail as if the devil himself was grabbing her arm. Suddenly, her free arm shot forward with incredible force, sending Dr. King crashing into the one-way mirror. The nurse, who was about to join Dr. King in his effort to awaken the girl, decided instead to stand back and wait for further instructions. It was Marge now, who was holding her daughter's shoulders and trying to shake her out of her sleep but her efforts were futile. Nancy was screaming and cursing, her vicious threats almost as shocking to Marge as the look of terror and fury on the girl's contorted features. Nancy! screamed Marge at the top of her lungs. It's Mom! It's Mommy! And then Nancy was awake, her eyes open but glazed. She surveyed the room like some cornered animal. Her breathing was fast and shallow, and her face was covered with sweat, as if she had been running for her life. She wrapped her arms around her mother and began to cry in a series of gut-wrenching sobs. Slowly, Dr. King approached with the hypodermic needle in his hand. "'This is just going to let you relax and sleep,' he began, but Nancy immediately lashed out with the back of her hand and sent the needle flying against the wall. "'No!' She said, a wild but determined look in her eye. That's enough sleep! Dr. King looked into the fire behind her eyes and nodded his head. Fair enough, 
he said, reaching out his hand in a gesture of peace. Nancy hesitated for a moment, and then took his hand. Exhausted, she fell back into the pillow. That was when Dr. King noticed the bloody gash on Nancy's forearm. "'Get my kit!' the doctor shouted, and the nurse scrambled away. Nancy looked almost calm now, a smile of victory on her pale white lips, as the doctor applied pressure to her bloody wound. "'I brought something out from my dream,' she said, reaching beneath the tangled sheets, and pulled out a crumpled old fedora hat. "'Where did you get that?' asked Marge, her face as white as her daughter's. "'I grabbed it off his head,' said Nancy, feeling calm and in control of her own destiny for the first time in days. <laughs> Chapter 7 Marge was leaning against the refrigerator, holding the filthy hat in her hand as she talked to Don Thompson on the phone. She said she snatched it off his head in a dream, Marge explained. She knew how crazy it sounded, and she wasn't surprised when her ex-husband expressed that very thought. I know it's impossible, she said, but I'm holding the damn thing in my hand. All I know is... She stopped abruptly at the sound of Nancy's footsteps on the hall stairs. I gotta go, said Marge, stuffing the hat into a drawer as she hung up the phone. Nancy didn't say good morning as she stepped into the kitchen and poured herself a cup of black coffee. Her skin had taken on a pale, almost translucent quality, and her eyes were ringed with dark circles. A streak of gray had appeared overnight in her uncombed hair. You didn't sleep again, did you? said March, gazing uneasily at the bloody bandage on her daughter's right arm. Nancy just sighed and sipped the hot coffee. The doctor says you have to sleep or you'll go even crazier. No, no one thinks you're crazy, said Marge. Nancy looked at her and shrugged as if the question were irrelevant. Did you ask Daddy to have the hat examined? That filthy hat, Marge said, avoiding the girl's eyes. I threw that thing away yesterday. I don't know what you're trying to prove with it, but... I'm trying to prove what I learned at the dream clinic, said Nancy, her eyes shining with her newfound conviction. I had it all wrong, Mom. I haven't, I haven't been dreaming the future at all. I've been dreaming reality. Rod didn't kill Tina, and he didn't hang himself. It's this guy. He's after us in our dreams. First Tina, and then Rod, and now he's after me. Marge shook her head violently from side to side. That's not reality, Nancy, she insisted. It's real enough for him to cut me, Nancy said, holding out her arm. Real enough for me to grab his hat and have it in my hand when I woke up. Marge opened her mouth, but no words came out. There were things she wanted to say, and yet... What are you afraid of? asked Nancy, seeing her mother's predicament. What do you know that you're not telling me, Mom? I'm not afraid of anything except what's happening to you, Marge lied, glancing for just a moment at the drawer near the telephone. Nancy followed her mother's gaze and suddenly yanked the drawer open. Is this real? Nancy demanded, holding the hat triumphantly in the air. Is this just something I dreamed about? Give me that damn thing now, demanded Marge, but Nancy was too fast. His name is even in it. Nancy's heart was pounding as she looked inside the battered hat. Fred Krueger. Do you know who that is, Mom? You better tell me if you know, because he's after me now. Trust your mother for once, Marge begged, pouring herself a drink. Nancy knew that her mother had once had a serious drinking problem, but she had been assured time and time again that the problem was under control. Judging by the glazed look in her mother's eyes, Nancy guessed that the woman had been hitting the bottle pretty hard during the past couple of hours. "'You'll feel better as soon as you get some sleep.' "'Feel better?' Nancy held up her bandaged arm. "'You call this feeling better? Or maybe I should just grab that bottle and veg out with you. Get good and loaded!' Suddenly, Marge reached out and slapped Nancy across the face. 
"'Damn it!' said Marge, the tears welling up in her eyes as she snatched the hat away from Nancy. "'Fred Krueger is dead!' Nancy stared at her mother in horror. "'You knew about him all along?' she said, more outraged by her, her mother's act of betrayal than by her unprecedented physical assault. "'You knew who this maniac is, and you kept acting like he was someone, what, I made up?' "'You're sick, Nancy,' said Marge, turning away to avoid her daughter's eyes. "'You're imagining things. You just need some sleep, that's all.' "'Screw sleep!' screamed Nancy, sweeping her injured arm across the table and sending her cup of coffee crashing to the floor. She jumped to her feet, grabbed her jacket from the hook on the wall, and bolted towards the back door. Nancy! Marge shouted, her eyes filled with tears. It's just a nightmare, for God's sake! Nancy turned in the doorway and glared at her mother with eyes of rage. That's enough! she said, before slamming the door behind her. Glenn sat on the hood of his red convertible and munched on a Big Mac. The car was parked on the edge of Lookout Drive, the scenic overlook that Glenn and Nancy had visited many times in the past, to make out while enjoying a spectacular view of the valley below. Today, Glenn knew there would be no making out, judging by the way Nancy was absorbed in the book she had brought along. Glenn doubted that she would even be noticing the view at all. He took another bite of his sandwich and realized that Nancy was staring at him. "'Whenever I get nervous, I eat,' he said. "'Or sleep,' she added. "'I used to,' said Glenn. "'Not any more.' There was an awkward pause before he spoke again. You ever read about the Balinese way of dreaming? No, said Nancy. She set her book aside and gave the boy her full attention. It was rare that Glenn talked about anything besides food, football, or the adolescent male's physical need for sexual intercourse. They got a whole system they call dream skills. He jumped down from the car to sit on the ground next to Nancy. Okay, say a person in Bali dreams they're falling or something. Instead of screaming and getting all upset, they just say, Okay, I'm going to fall, but instead of getting splattered all over the ground, I'm going to fall into a magic world. A magic world? Right. A magic world where you can get something special, like a gift of wisdom or a great song. That's where they get all their art from, from dreams. They just wake up and write it all down. And what if they meet a monster in their dreams, asked Nancy. Then what? They turn their backs on it, said Glenn, beginning to improvise. That takes away its energy, all its power, so it disappears. Nancy glanced at her book again, but Glenn sensed that she was still thinking about what he had said. What happens if they don't do that, she asked. What happens if they don't turn away in time? Glenn shrugged. I guess those people don't wake up to tell what happened he said. Thanks a lot, said Nancy, turning back to her book in earnest. Glenn tipped back the cover of the book and read the title. Booby Traps and Improvise Anti-Personnel Devices? Where the hell did you find that? Survivalist Bookstore Downtown, said Nancy without looking up from the page. Well, how come you're reading it? asked Glenn. Nancy looked up thoughtfully. I'm into survival, she said. "'You're starting to scare me a little,' said Glenn, taking another bite of his Big Mac. "'I'm starting to scare myself,' thought Nancy. Nancy's feelings of impending doom grew even stronger an hour later when Glenn dropped her off at her house on Elm Street. Every window in the house had been covered with brand new iron bars. "'What's going on around here?' Nancy demanded, finding her mother inside, a bottle of gin clutched tightly in her fist. Marge looked at her daughter for a long moment before replying. "'Come down to the cellar with me, Nancy,' she said. Nancy followed her mother down the stairs and sat beside her in front of the old furnace. "'All right,' said Marge, looking Nancy squarely in the eye for the first time in days. "'You want to know Fred Krueger? You want to know who he was?' I'll tell you, Freddy Krueger was a filthy child killer who got at least 20 kids before we stopped him. 
okay? Kids from around here. Kids we all knew. It drove us all crazy when we didn't know who was doing it. But it was even worse when they caught him. Did they put him away? Nancy suddenly felt very warm, despite the chill in the air. Marge shook her head. Some lawyers got fat, and the judge got famous, but someone forgot to sign the search warrant in the right place, and Fred Krueger was free, just like that. So he's alive? Marge shook her head, slowly from side to side. A bunch of us parents tracked him down, right after they let him go. We found him in the old abandoned boiler room, where he used to take the kids. Go on, said Nancy, flinching at the words, boiler room. He was lying there in that red and green sweater that he always wore, drunk as a skunk, with those horrible knives on the floor next to him. We poured gasoline all around the place, left a trail out the door. Marge paused and gazed off into the distance. Then we lit the whole thing up and watched it burn. Nancy stared at the slightly inebriated middle-aged woman sitting beside her and tried to picture her as part of an angry mob taking justice into its own hands. It was not an easy image to conjure up. So you see, Nancy, said Marge, oblivious to her daughter's thoughts, you have nothing to worry about. He can't get you. He's dead. Mommy killed him. She reached into the old furnace and pulled out an object wrapped in rags. I even took his knives, she said, unwrapping the horrible bladed glove that Nancy recognized from her dreams. Nancy stared at the obscene object in her mother's hand and tried desperately to make sense of things that made no sense. Freddy Krueger was dead, and dead men don't take revenge on the living, not even in their worst nightmares. Then Nancy looked at her arm and saw that her wound had begun to bleed. Glenn was in bed watching a rerun of his favorite sitcom later that night when the telephone rang. Hello? Hi. Nancy, uh, how are you doing? I'm okay. Stand by your window so I can see you. You sound like you're a million miles away. Glenn did as he was told and saw Nancy through the bars on her bedroom window. Your mom really went nuts at the security store, he said. You look like the prisoner of Zenda or something. Thanks, said Nancy. How long has it been since you slept? I think it's been seven days. It's okay, though. I I checked Guinness and the record's 11. I can beat that with my eyes closed. Nancy paused and laughed weakly at her own joke. Listen, Glenn, she said, her voice now deadly serious. I know who he is. Who? The killer. You do? Yeah, and if he gets me, I'm pretty sure you'll be next. Me? Suddenly, Glenn was taking the whole conversation a lot more seriously. Why would anyone want to kill me? Don't ask, said Nancy. Just give me some... Just... I need some help nailing this guy when I bring him out, okay? Bring him out of what? My dream. For a moment, Glenn wondered if his parents weren't on to something when they pointed out that Nancy Thompson was getting very strange lately. How are you going to do that? He said after a long pause. Just like I did the hat. Only this time I'll have my hands on the killer when you wake me up. Wait a minute, said Glenn. You can't really bring someone out of a dream. No problem, then, said Nancy. If I can't do it, then everyone can relax, because it'll just be a simple case of me going nuts. I can save you the trouble, said Glenn with a grin. You're nutty as a fruitcake, but I love you anyway. Good, then you won't mind cold-cocking the guy when I bring him out. What? It's real simple, said Nancy. I grab him in the dream, and when you see me struggling, you wake me up. We both come out, you whack the sucker, and we've got him clever, huh? Are you crazy? What am I supposed to hit him with? You're a jock, said Nancy, sounding slightly annoyed. You must have a baseball bat or something. Just meet me on my porch at midnight, all right? And whatever you do, don't fall asleep. Glenn waited for Nancy to hang up before flopping down on his unmade bed. Oh, man, he said out loud, shaking his head slowly from side to side. Midnight. Baseball bats and boogeyman. Beautiful.
Chapter 8 Several hours later, Glenn's mother went upstairs to say goodnight to her son. She knocked gently on the bedroom door and called his name. There was no answer. Glenn, are you all right? Silence. Glenn, honey. She waited a few seconds and then opened the door. Glenn was sprawled across the bed in front of the television set, his eyes shut tight, and rock music blaring through his stereo headphones. Mrs. Lance switched off the TV in the stereo before poking Glenn gently in the ribs with a loosely clenched fist. Glenn opened his eyes, yawned, and slipped off his headphones. "'How can you watch TV and listen to the stereo at the same time?' asked his mother, smiling fondly at the sleepy teen. Glenn lazily returned his mother's smile and swung his long legs over the side of the bed. "'I wasn't listening to the tube,' he explained. "'Just watching. Miss Newt America's supposed to be on tonight.' "'How are you going to hear what she says?' "'Who cares what she says, Ma?' "'Don't be such a smart guy,' said Mrs. Lance." She gave the boy a playful swipe with the back of her hand. You should get some sleep, Glenn. It's almost midnight. God knows we all need our rest after what's been going on around here lately. I'll turn in soon, Mom. You and Dad going to bed now? Pretty soon, she said. Get to sleep. She kissed the boy good night and left the room. Glenn waited until his mother had closed the bedroom door before turning the TV back on. He glanced at the clock. 11.42. Plenty of time before midnight, he thought, clamping the headphones back on and turning the stereo on loud. Then he lay back to rest his eyes for just a minute before heading off to Nancy's house. Across the street, a similar scene was being enacted at the Thompson home. Nancy was lying in bed while her mother busily gathered up empty coffee cups and boxes of no-dos. "'Get some sleep,' said Marge, still a little tipsy, as she kissed Nancy tenderly on the forehead. "'The nightmare's over, honey.' Marge glared at the bars on the bedroom windows and felt strangely comforted. "'Everything's going to be all right from now on.' "'Okay, Mom,' said Nancy, barely able to keep her eyes open. Marge hesitated for a moment, then picked up the coffee pot from Nancy's night table and turned off the light. "'Night-night,' she whispered. Nancy closed her eyes and pulled the blanket up over her shoulders as her mother tiptoed out of the room and closed the door quietly behind her. Five seconds later, Nancy's eyes snapped open. She jumped out of bed and took several deep breaths to fight off the sleep that felt like some powerful physical entity was trying to envelop her. Reaching under her night table, she found the full pot of coffee that she had stashed there earlier and poured some into the large mug she had hidden beneath her pillow. She rapidly drained the cup and then stepped over to the window. She opened it, pressed her face against the bars, and sucked in the cool night air. At that moment, Glenn's father was standing on his porch smoking one last cigarette before turning in for the night. He glanced up at Nancy's bedroom window and saw the girl's pale face just before she pulled down the shade. "'You really shouldn't stare,' said Mrs. Lance. Her husband crushed the cigarette butt under his shoe. "'If you ask me,' he said, still staring at the Thompson home, "'that kid is some kind of lunatic.' "'You know you don't mean that,' said Mrs. Lance." If you mean the bars, that's just Marge being extra cautious. You know how jumpy she's been since Don moved out. Besides, with Nancy acting so nervous lately... All's I know, her husband interrupted, is I don't want that strange girl hanging around with our boy anymore. Come to bed, said Mrs. Lance. She took her husband by the hand and pulled him gently toward the house. It's almost midnight. Nancy looked at the clock on her night table and wondered what the hell was keeping Glenn. Across the street, Glenn was fast asleep, the headphones blasting loud music in his ears while the television flickered its colored lights in his face. He slept right through Miss Newt America and never even heard the telephone ring. 
Downstairs, his father had just turned off the lights. "'Who the hell could be calling at this hour?' he demanded, as his wife lifted the receiver to find out. "'Hello? Hold on.' She covered the mouthpiece. "'It's her,' she whispered. "'She wants to speak to Glenn.' "'About what?' asked Mr. Lance, sounding very annoyed as he glanced at his watch. "'What's this about, Nancy?' Mrs. Lance asked. She listened for a moment and then covered the mouthpiece with her hand again. "'She says it's private. Very private and very important.' "'Give me that,' said Mr. Lance, grabbing the receiver from his wife. "'Glenn's asleep,' he said. "'Talk to him tomorrow.' Without waiting for a reply, he slammed down the telephone. "'You have to be firm with these kids,' he told his wife. He glanced back at the phone and then took the receiver off the hook for good measure. "'Let's get some sleep,' he said, feeling really in control for the first time that day. Nancy dialed Glenn's phone number again and got a busy signal. "'Please don't be asleep,' she whispered, staring helplessly out the window. Then the phone rang and Nancy snatched it up. Glenn? But all she heard was the horrible screeching sound of metal scraping against metal. Nancy slammed the phone down, a pulse now throbbing in her temples. In anger and frustration, she yanked hard on the phone, ripping it out of the wall. Brilliant, she thought, picking the phone up and dropping the useless instrument on her bed. Now what if Glenn tries to call? She stepped over to the window and stared helplessly at the house across the street. And then the phone rang again. Nancy whirled around and stared at the disconnected telephone as it rang a second time. Slowly, almost as though she were moving through water, Nancy reached out her hand and picked up the receiver. Hello, she said. I'm your boyfriend now, Nancy, said the triumphant voice of Fred Krueger. Before Nancy could say a word, the mouthpiece of the telephone suddenly turned into a mouth, its long, snaky tongue darting out and insinuating itself disgustingly between Nancy's parted lips. Nancy threw the phone down, smashing it into the wall. She stared at the obscene instrument in horror, still tasting the foul tongue in her mouth. And suddenly, the meaning of Fred Krueger's strange message became clear to her. Glenn! She screamed, running out of her room and down the stairs to the front door. Locked, said her mother's slurred voice from the living room couch. Locked, locked, locked. I locked it all up. There was a drunken smile on Marge's face. You're going to sleep tonight if it kills you. Give me the key, mother said Nancy, knowing even as she spoke that it was already too late. Forget it. Marge took another swallow from the bottle at her side. I don't even have it on me. There was no time to argue. Nancy ran to the back door, locked. She tried each of the locked windows, shaking the bars in frustration and fury, but it was no use. Nancy was a prisoner in her own house, and there was no way to warn Glenn that the boogeyman was on his way. In his dream, Glenn thought he heard Nancy call his name. He had a vague notion of getting up and finding out what she wanted, but appearing on The Tonight Show and meeting Miss Nude America was a much more interesting prospect. He lay back on the sofa in the green room and waited patiently for Johnny Carson to introduce him. Glenn never noticed that the bed had begun to shake or that a foul aroma had begun to permeate the bedroom air. Had he been a lighter sleeper, Glenn might have woken up when Freddy's powerful arms first shot up from beneath the covers, grabbed him tight and pulled him deep into the bed, the stereo and the TV following close behind. Instead, Glenn continued to sleep as he clawed desperately at his blanket and sheets, trying with what little strength he had left to keep from being pulled still deeper into the abyss. But his efforts were too feeble and much too late. By the time Glenn began to struggle in earnest, the deadly blades of Freddy Krueger had already hacked and sliced their way through half a dozen of his vital organs. 
There was a moment of stillness, and then the bed began to bubble and gurgle like some obscene volcano about to erupt. Suddenly, a geyser of blood shot into the air, covering the walls and ceiling as the lifeless remains of Lynn Lance were vomited up from the center of the bed. A sickening mess of guts and brains and bones and shredded flesh steaming over the edge like a river of gore. And then, when there was nothing left of Glenn to continue the dream, the pit in the middle of the bed closed up as if it had never been there at all. Mrs. Lance walked in a minute later to bring Glenn a fresh pillowcase. <coughs> Even from across the street, Nancy could hear Mrs. Lance's anguished scream. Nancy was looking out the window when the ambulance and the police cars arrived. She saw her father climb out of the unmarked car that screeched to a halt in front of Glenn's house and waved to him from behind the bars. He returned the wave quickly and then hurried into the Lance's house. Nancy pulled down the window shade, went downstairs, and dialed Glenn's phone number. Chapter 9 Lieutenant Don Thompson was standing in the Lance living room a few minutes after midnight when the telephone rang. It's your daughter, said Parker. She says it's urgent. A look of annoyance passed over Thompson's face. Tell her I'm not here, he said, watching the coroner head upstairs. She saw you a minute ago, said Parker, his hand covering the mouthpiece. The lieutenant shrugged his shoulders and reached for the telephone. Hi, honey. I know what happened, she said, her voice strangely calm. Then you know more than I do. I haven't even been upstairs, baby. You know he's dead, though, right? The lieutenant paused a moment and watched one of the uniformed men position a bucket in the middle of the living room floor. He looked up and saw blood dripping through the ceiling. Yeah, apparently he's dead. How the hell did you know? Listen carefully, said Nancy, ignoring her father's questions. I've got a proposition for you. Go ahead, he said, only half listening as he watched the blood slowly drip into the bucket. I'm going to get the guy who did it, said Nancy. I'm going to get him and bring him to you. All you have to do is be there to arrest him, okay? You don't have to do anything, baby, said the lieutenant. He wondered if the breakup of his marriage had had anything to do with his daughter's mental collapse. Just tell me who did it and I'll go get him. Fred Krueger did, Daddy, and I'm the only one who can get him. Just come over here in exactly 20 minutes and break down the door. Can you do that? Sure, but half past midnight, said Nancy, glancing at her wristwatch. That should be enough time for me to fall asleep and find him. Okay, honey, said Thompson, wondering why in the hell Marge had decided to tell Nancy about Fred Krueger at a time like this. You just get yourself some sleep, and everything will be all right. And you'll be there to catch him, right? Before the lieutenant could reply, Parker appeared at the head of the stairs and reminded him that the coroner was waiting. Don't worry, honey, he told Nancy, nodding to Parker. I'll be there. You just get yourself some rest, deal? Deal, said Nancy. I love you, sweetheart. Thompson hung up the phone and began to head up the stairs. Suddenly, he stopped and turned to Parker. Go outside and watch my daughter's house, he said. If you see anything funny, you let me know. What do you mean, funny? I don't know, said the lieutenant, suddenly feeling a little foolish. One thing's for sure, I don't want Nancy coming over here. She's too far gone to be able to handle anything like this. I wish to God I didn't have to handle it myself, he thought, as he quickly climbed the stairs. Across the street, Nancy was hard at work, preparing to do battle. With her survival manual at her side, she began quickly to construct the weapons she would need to fight Freddy Krueger. Her hands were surprisingly steady as she carefully strung piano wire across the living room, filled a light bulb with powder from shotgun shells that Glenn had swiped from his father's gun case, and hinged the sledgehammer she had found in the cellar to a trigger mechanism over her bedroom door. Then, when she was finished setting her homemade booby traps, Nancy went upstairs and peeked into her mother's bedroom. Marge was lying in bed, 
the half-empty bottle of gin still at her side. I guess I shouldn't have done it, she said, looking sadly at Nancy. Just sleep, okay, Mom? Nancy sat at her mother's side and took hold of her hand. I just wanted to protect you, said Marge. I didn't see how much you needed to know. You face things. That's your nature. That's your gift. Marge paused and looked at the bottle at her side. But sometimes you have to turn away, too, she concluded with the shrug of her slender shoulders. I love you, Mom, said Nancy. Oh, I love you, too, said Marge. Nancy pulled the covers up over her mother's shoulders and tiptoed out of the room. She went into her own room, crawled into bed, and set the alarm on her wristwatch to go off at exactly 12.30. Okay, Kruger, she said as she closed her eyes. We play on your court. Nancy was rummaging through the old furnace in the cellar. She pulled out the bundle of rags in which her mother had saved Freddy's glove and carefully unwrapped it. As she expected, the glove was gone. Nancy looked behind the furnace and noticed a door that she had never seen before. With only a moment's hesitation, she opened the door and began to descend the long staircase. She was startled when the door slammed shut behind her, but she knew that it would ultimately make no difference. Closed doors have no meaning in the world of dreams. Then she reached the bottom of the stairs and found herself once more in the vast boiler room. Nancy walked down the narrow passageway, the adrenaline pumping through her system, filling her with a sense of purpose that almost transcended her terror. Kruger! she screamed. I'm here! She continued along a series of treacherous catwalks, carefully avoiding the scalding hot pipes that surrounded her on all sides. It wasn't time to wake up yet. She paused a moment to catch her breath and noticed a familiar object, Tina's crucifix. She examined the crucifix for a moment and then continued her descent down a seemingly endless procession of ladders that brought her ever closer to the great roaring fire below. She was only a few yards from the fierce orange blaze when she almost stepped on Glenn's partially melted headphones. Come out and show yourself, you bastard! She shouted, her voice now indisputably that of the hunter and not the hunted. And then Freddy showed himself, more hideous than ever. With his head uncovered, his horribly scarred face transformed by the unspeakable hatred he felt for the girl who had dared to challenge his power. Without a moment's hesitation, he lashed out with his razor-sharp finger knives, but this time Nancy was ready for him. She stepped back into the darkness, strangely confident that no harm could come to her as long as she avoided Freddy's deadly blades. She was falling now, but the scenery had abruptly changed. She crashed to the ground, no longer in the dank boiler room, but on her own front lawn. Nancy scrambled to her feet, knowing that if this had not been a dream, every bone in her body would have been crushed by the fall. Breathing the fresh night air, she ran toward the front door, eager to get back to the safety of her own bed. And then Kruger was behind her, an obscene chuckle of triumph welling up from somewhere deep in his throat. He swiped at Nancy with his blade, certain that she would be unable to open the door before feeling the wrath of his deadly glove. But Nancy attempted neither to open the door nor to flee from her attacker. Instead, she threw herself forward, grabbing Freddy around the middle and knocking him over on his back as she deftly avoided his lethal right hand. Then the alarm went off, and Nancy woke up. Still shaking and breathless, she looked around, almost disappointed not to find the man in the filthy sweater lying beside her in the bed. Of course, she was glad to have escaped, but Nancy knew that the nightmares would not end until she finally succeeded and bringing Fred Krueger out of her dream. Bring him out of my dream, she thought, hearing as if for the first time the absurdity of the idea. I guess maybe I am crazy after all, she said aloud, remembering her last conversation with Glenn. Then Fred Krueger leaped at her from the side of the bed with an explosive scream of rage. Nancy rolled off the bed in time to avoid Freddy's claw and darted to the window. Searching desperately for a weapon, she grabbed her coffee pot and brought it crashing down on his head. 
He was still bellowing with rage as she dashed through the door and through the outside bolt, stopping for just a second to attach the string from the sledgehammer to the bedroom doorknob. Nancy raced downstairs and headed for the front door, locked. She smashed the glass window and began screaming for help. Upstairs, the enraged madman had already discovered that walking through locked doors was no easy task outside of the world of dreams. His shoulders were strong, however, and it did not take him long to break the feeble latch that held shut Nancy's bedroom door. He threw the door open and stepped boldly out of the room. Instantly, he was struck hard in the chest by the full force of a 20-pound sledgehammer. Bellowing with pain and anger, Freddy stumbled out into the hallway and tripped over the fishing line Nancy had strung across the top of the staircase. He came crashing down the stairs, sprawling at Nancy's feet as she continued to scream for help through the broken window. And then Freddy was on his feet again, and Nancy was running to the living room, mocking and taunting the furious madman from behind the couch. I'm gonna split you in two! Freddy croaked, enraged by Nancy's courage and audacity. He took a step toward her, his finger knives held high, and tripped over the wire attached to the lamp, in which Nancy had placed the powder-filled light bulb. As Freddy stumbled, the circuit was completed and a loud explosion sent him flying across the room. He lay on the floor, too stunned to move, while Nancy raced back to the front door. Help! She screamed. I've got him trapped, Daddy! Where are you? Jerry Parker looked at the girl from across the street and waved reassuringly to her. Everything's under control, he shouted. Get my father, you asshole! Nancy shouted back, her outrage momentarily overtaking her fear. For a moment, she felt as if she had more control over the monstrous Freddy Krueger than she did over the moronic police officer across the street. Parker looked at the girl and then glanced at the house behind him. The last thing he needed was to have the lieutenant on his case. Better safe than sorry, he thought, as he went inside to report that Lieutenant Thompson's daughter was asking for him. Meanwhile, Freddy was back on his feet and hot in pursuit of the girl who had dared to defy him. Nancy fled to the cellar with Freddy only a few steps behind. Following the plan she had worked out in advance, Nancy hid behind the furnace and waited until Freddy's back was turned. Then she picked up the bottle of gasoline she had left on the steps and called his name. Freddy turned around and Nancy doused him with the highly flammable liquid. No! screamed Freddy in horror as Nancy ignited an entire box of kitchen matches and threw the flaming box in his direction. It was too late to duck. Instantly, Freddy was enveloped in flame, screaming in agony that he had not felt since that horrible day ten years prior when he vowed to take his revenge on the people of Springwood. Nancy reached the top of the cellar stairs and stationed herself behind the door just seconds before the flaming madman started to follow. He was about to pull open the door when Nancy suddenly pushed it forward with all of her strength, knocking him down the stairs with a terrible crash. She barely had enough time to throw the deadbolt on the cellar door before she heard Freddy charging back up the stairs. She arrived at the front door just as her father stepped out onto Glenn's porch across the street. Daddy! She screamed. I did it! Please hurry! Lieutenant Thompson saw the look of urgency on his daughter's face and called to a few of the uniformed patrolmen for help. Together, the men quickly broke down the locked door and rushed into the home. Nancy threw herself into her father's arms as Parker and the others raced toward the smoking cellar. "'What the hell is going on?' asked the lieutenant. Nancy was about to explain when she noticed the trail of flaming footsteps that led from the cellar door across the living room carpet and up the front stairs. "'He's after mother!' Nancy shouted, dashing up the stairs with her father close behind. She arrived at Marge's bedroom to find her mother pinned to the bed by the still-flaming Freddy Krueger. Without a moment's hesitation, Nancy picked up a chair and brought it crashing down over the fiery monster's head. Freddy fell to one side just as Lieutenant entered the room and threw a heavy blanket over the burning bed. Watch it! screamed Nancy. He's under there! Immediately, the Lieutenant yanked the top cover off the bed. The fire was out, but the bed continued to glow with an eerie reddish light. 
In its center lay the charred corpse of Marge Thompson, smoking and seething as it sank slowly into the mattress, its gnarled and blackened hand waving a gruesome farewell. Then the glow faded, and the hole that had become Marge's eternal grave closed up forever. "'Now do you believe me?' asked Nancy, a strange calm descending on her as she looked her father in the eye. Before the lieutenant could reply, Parker burst in to report that the fire downstairs was under control. Don Thompson looked at his daughter, but could find no words to express what he was feeling. "'I'm okay,' she said, knowing that the nightmare was rapidly approaching its inevitable end. "'You go downstairs. I'll be there in a minute.' The lieutenant hesitated for a moment, and then left the room, closing the door behind him. Nancy turned her back to the bed and waited. Slowly, the figure of Fred Krueger rose, ghost-like, from the center of the mattress. "'I know you're there, Freddy,' said Nancy, turning to face the charred monster. "'You thought you was gonna get away from me?' he croaked, surprised by the calmness of her voice. "'I know you too well now, Freddy,' Nancy replied. Freddy grinned, confident that the chase was over at last. "'And now!' "'You die!' he said, his gleaming steel talons poised to strike one more time. But Nancy just looked at him and shook her head. "'It's too late, Kruger. I know the secret now. This is just a dream. You're not alive. It's only a dream.' She paused to let her words sink in, and then took a deep breath. "'I want my mother and my friends again,' she said. "'You what?' the madman bellowed. I take back every bit of energy I ever gave you, said Nancy quickly, turning her back on Fred Krueger for the last time as she walked slowly toward the bedroom door. You're nothing, Krueger, she said calmly. You're shit. Freddy stepped behind her, his finger knives bunched together and poised over the back of her neck. Nancy took another deep breath and reached for the doorknob as the deadly steel talons began to come down, and then... Chapter 10 And then it was morning. Nancy stepped outside into a beautiful new day and squinted at the blinding sunlight. God, it's bright, she said, shading her eyes with her hand. It's gonna to, it's gonna burn off soon, said Marge Thompson, stepping out of the house right behind her daughter. Otherwise, it wouldn't be so bright. The sun's just trying hard. Nancy looked at her mother and smiled. She had a vague sense of something having been wrong the night before, but it was impossible to think about unpleasant things on a magnificent morning like this. Feeling better? Nancy asked. I feel like a million bucks, said her mother, and Nancy thought she looked it. They say you bought him out when you can't remember the night before. She paused and slowly nodded her head as if making an important decision. No more drinking for me, baby. I just don't seem to like it anymore. She turned and looked at Nancy. I kept you up last night, didn't I? You look a little peaked. I guess I just slept heavy, said Nancy, vaguely recalling some unpleasant dream that might have disturbed her sleep. Before she could give the matter any more thought, however, a red convertible with its top down pulled up to the curb in front of the house. Glenn Lance was at the wheel as usual. while Tina Gray and Rod Lane held hands in the back seat. "'You believe this fog?' Glenn called out to Nancy's mother as Nancy climbed into the front seat of the convertible. "'I believe anything's possible,' said Marge with a cheerful laugh as she waved goodbye to Nancy and her friends. Glenn was about to drive off when the top of the convertible suddenly clamped down like a sprung trap. "'What are you doing?' asked Rod. I "'I'm not doing anything,' said Glenn." And it was true. It wasn't he who had closed the top, or shut all the windows, or locked all the doors, or painted the weird red and green stripes on the convertible top. Mother! screamed Nancy, but Marge never heard her daughter's screams of terror as the demon automobile drove itself away and disappeared into the fog. Nancy's mother was still smiling and waving from the doorway when a talon-tipped hand suddenly shattered the glass window behind her, grabbed Marge by the throat, and yanked her back into the house with superhuman strength. Perhaps it wasn't going to be such a wonderful day on Elm Street, after all. Uh -huh.
The end. Okay, Slashaholics, this has been A Nightmare on Elm Street, the novelization of the first film. And wow, I gotta say, I really enjoyed it. Although it was uh, pretty short compared to other novelizations, um, and it stayed really true to the movie, it was still a really entertaining read that had me wanting to get back to it quickly. And uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it too. I re- what I really love about the first Elm Street is how Freddy, and, and don't get me wrong, I love voicing Freddy, it's a lot of fun, but I really enjoy how he's not really the campy, talkative guy he is in the later movies, and he's more terrifying in this one, and I love the uh, the part of the first movie at the end where you're like, okay, was the whole movie a dream? Is this a dream? Is the dream still going? Is it not over? Are they all dead? Are they all about to die? I love that ambiguity of it, you know, and uh, I'm glad that the novelization didn't change any of that, and I'm, I'm kind of glad it wasn't different, to be honest with you, because I always thought the first Elm Street was perfect, and uh, I really enjoyed narrating it and bringing it to you guys. I'm going to narrate uh, part two, three, four, and five as well, but I'm going to skip Freddy's Revenge for now, and I'm going to be doing uh, Dream Warriors uh, pretty soon. Um, if you're listening to this far, you know, away from the upload date, then by then I've probably already done Freddy's Revenge and all of them. But if you're listening to this pretty close to, uh, you know, March 24th when I'm uploading it, then yeah, I'll be doing uh, Dream Warriors before I do Freddy's Revenge. And I've heard that it's a lot different than uh, the movie, so I'm looking forward to that big time. Uh, But yeah, guys, uh, wow, I really hope you guys enjoyed it. There's not a whole lot more I can say about it. I said a lot in the individual uploads at the ends of the chapters. Um, I like the writing. We didn't get a whole lot of extra stuff, but that's okay because uh, you really just can't mess with perfection, and the first movie was perfection. The novelization of it stuck, stayed true to it. I really enjoyed it. Uh, Freddy's a lot more terrifying in, in the first movie and in this novelization. Uh, but I'd love to hear from you guys in the comment section below. Let me know what you thought of the book. And if you're looking forward to the other novelizations, uh, there was actually only two books written uh, of the novelizations, as you can see on the screen there, the uh, cover. Uh, One book has parts one, two, and three. The other one has four and five. Uh, But I didn't want to put, you know, one, two, and three all in one unabridged upload. I want to, I want to split them up into their own. That's why I did this one separately, and I'll do two and separately, three separately. And I think you guys will enjoy it more that way. I know I will. And uh, yeah. I'll be back very soon with more Slasher Mayhem here on the 80 Slasher Librarian YouTube channel. Until then, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80 Slasher Librarian saying, thanks for listening, be safe, and pleasant dreams! <laughs>
Magnified, sanctified, be the holy name. Vilified, crucified in the human frame. A million candles burning for the love that never came. <laughs>